What is up, party people? Welcome in to the Back to 12 podcast. I am your host, R.C. Maxfield. Lyle will be joining me here shortly, but right now, hey, it's just me, and we're getting everything up, we'll ready. We are going to be uh, talking a lot of Texas Tech today in the sense that this is probably the biggest day of the year for Texas Tech when it comes down to it in terms of the athletic department. And you're back in a bowl game. There's a big men's basketball game, and there's just a lot of buzz around the really athletic program as a whole. Before we get started, though, I'm going to tweet this link out real quick. Make sure everybody has it. Make sure you go retweet it as well. Hopping over to my Twitter right now. Do that. I'll give you a shout out if you like it on there. I'm going to have to shout out quite a few people um, on this one. So be ready for that as well. It's one of those deals where I asked for y'all to come in here and really flood my uh, comment section over on Twitter. And y'all did just that, giving me 40, I believe, 40 right now. Let me check real quick. I lied to you. 41. Hashtag Dirk over here making work happen. Y'all gave me 41 score predictions for tonight game, tonight's game between Mississippi State and Texas Tech. And I will shout out each and every one of you on Twitter. But first, let me get this link out and make sure that if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button right here on YouTube. And then I'll give you a shout out as well as we are creeping up to 125 subscribers trying to get to maybe it's a tall task tonight. But we know that there's a there's a pleasure in the process, right? So we know that 150 may be a little too high, but we're trying to get there. Again, Lyle will join us later on, and we have an exciting announcement about Texas Tech men's basketball and who will be joining us here on the Back to 12 podcast. Moving forward to discuss it, one of the best covering it right now, but I'll keep that tease in the book. Let me get this tweet out real quick, and then we'll jump right into the post-game show for Texas Tech and Alabama State where the Red Raiders Full court press looking like West Virginia a little bit out there. And we'll talk about who my favorite player is on this team. And I'm pretty sure you're right there with me. But let me get this tweet out real quick. And then we will start this live show off with a bang. It would help if I could spell, you know what I'm saying right now? It really would help if I could spell. Get this tweet out there, guys, and I'll be right back. I promise. All right, guys, let's go bump that one up real quick. Now we are going to talk about, well, here we go. Let's have some fun. Get those comments in there, too. You can get your predictions in and everything like that in terms of what y'all think will happen tonight. There we go. We got Red Raider Mitch. What's up, man? Appreciate y'all staying patient with me getting that tweet out there real quick. Lyle will be joining me soon. 
We're going to be here up right until kickoff of the AutoZone Liberty Bowl. We're going to break down Texas Tech men's basketball and their win over Alabama State. Who knew that Mo Williams, a former, really one of my favorite players in the NBA, played with LeBron up in Cleveland for a while, also kind of a journeyman around the NBA, was their head coach there. They're 1-10, in 10, but also went through the gauntlet of the Big 12. If you want to see how good the Big 12 is, look at the Alabama State schedule this year. They played Iowa State, Texas, and now Texas Tech. All three teams are ranked. I mean, just an absolutely brutal schedule for a SWAC team that was finished or projected to finish in the middle of their conference. I expect them to finish a little bit higher than that. But let's talk about Texas Tech right now in terms of what's going down for the Red Raiders as really Texas Tech. There's it's hard to judge this team, in my opinion, right now. Right. You think about it. Your best player is not playing right now. And I think that is obvious. It's Terrence Shannon Jr. He is by far your best player. I think he'll be a mid first round pick in the NBA draft. He really has improved a lot. But the thing is, with Terrence Shannon Jr. out, you get to see other guys really fill into these roles that you don't know what you're going to have, but the non-conference is perfect to see what you do have. And the prime example of that is Adonis Arms. I mean, I don't know who your favorite player is. Let me know in the comments who y'all's favorite player is on Texas Tech men's basketball. But for me, it's pretty easy. This is Adonis Arms. like, And that might be including Terrence Shannon into the mix, too. And I love Terrence Shannon when he showed up to campus with Jalen Ramsey. Um, or not Jalen Ramsey. My goodness. Ramsey, my goodness. I just put an NFL all pro cornerback on the Texas Tech men's basketball roster. I'm pretty sure he'd be great anyway. But Jemias Ramsey, my goodness, it's going to be a long day if that's how we're starting. Now. No worries at all. Okay, so I think when you look at what Texas Tech has in terms of this skill set on the roster, right, we've been disappointed a little bit when it comes down to really the Bachos, not Bachos, excuse me, Williams and O'Banners of the world. Bacho has just played out of his mind, in my opinion. I knew that he was a very high level recruit goes to Arizona obviously Sean Miller and the scandal out there and really Bacho hurting his knee early on being out in Tucson didn't allow him to show his talents out in the Pac-12 but he's going to get more playing time going into the Big 12 because Texas Tech starts out with an absolute gauntlet I mean an absolute gauntlet of a Big 12 schedule I mean I don't remember the last time that Texas Tech would have to do something like this I mean you think about it it is absolutely brutal um, what Texas Tech is having to go through in terms of just opening up the Big 12, right? You think about who they play. They play Iowa State, Kansas, and then Baylor. That is rough. I mean, it doesn't get much harder than that in terms of just starting out the conference play. And now you're going to know what you're made of pretty much right away. And I do expect Terrence Shannon to be back in the mix for the Red Raiders early on in conference play, maybe not against the first team that they face off against, which will be the Cyclones, but he could in that game just because maybe it's a blessing in disguise that you don't have that game on Saturday now against the Oklahoma State Cowboys. That game has now been moved to January 13th due to COVID outbreak in the Oklahoma State locker room there. So when you think about what Texas Tech has going into conference play and just the gauntlet that is the Big 12, well, you're going to find out very, very quickly what you have in your team, just because, again, you face the number eight team in the country to start off Big 12 play. Then you play Kansas and then you play number one Baylor. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I think Baylor, again, it makes me want to throw up in the bucket next to me here in the trash can. But Baylor is the best team in the Big 12. And I think they're the best team in the I mean, Scott Drew just replenished a roster that lost a lot of great players last year on that national championship team. Texas Tech is going to have its hands full with that, but not even just Texas Tech. The whole Big 12 is going to have its hands full with that moving forward. But let's talk about this game against Alabama State because there was a lot of interesting aspects that you see Texas Tech gravitating towards and when you have a lot of guys coming in, right, from the transfer portal in Texas, Tech had a lot of them. Just a couple off the top of my head, O'Banner, Warren, Williams, Arms, the list goes down the line, right? It takes a while for these guys to mesh. And just the reality of it, not, not all these guys are going to live up to the high potential that we think they should, right? I think the prime example right now for Texas Tech and a guy that I was high on coming into the year, and hopefully it's just a slow start for him, was 
Bryson Williams. I mean, Bryson Williams just hasn't played that great moving forward or right now going into this year. And the thing is for me, when you look at what Bryson Williams lacks, there's other guys on this roster that can come in and play that position and really just clean up the parts that Bryson Williams just isn't good at. And Bryson Williams is not a great defender down low. Who do you bring in to really come in and really negate that? You bring in Daniel Bacho. And this team is built for success long-term, in my opinion. It really is. It's just how long can this team last without its star player going into conference play? And let's not get it twisted. As long as Texas Tech wins about eight, nine games in conference play, they'll be an NCAA tournament team. Don't get that twisted. The Big 12 is an absolute gauntlet, as I've said multiple times now. But you need your star player in Terrence Shannon Jr. to be be healthy because I don't know if this team can even come close to its potential long term. But today was a good sign. And I get it. We're talking about a one in 10 team coming in in Alabama State, now one in 11, leaving the 806. But there is a lot that I really take as positives for Texas Tech moving forward from this game. The biggest being Adonis Arms. And by the way, if it's weird to y'all that I have a blurred zoom in the background, let me know. It makes my head look super big. I can get behind that, but it is big. There we go. Anyway, back to Adonis Arms real quick. I think Adonis Arms is one of those guys for Texas Tech that even myself, who I was super excited to see what he could bring to Texas Tech in terms of maybe I even limited him in terms of what he could have done. But looking at what he brings to the table, this man right now, and I mean this in no disrespectful way to Kevin McCuller because we know that he's the X factor for this team, but Adonis Arms is the most versatile player on this roster for Texas Tech. And I think that is an absolute blessing for the Red Raiders moving forward because now you have a guy on, whether if you want to start him or not in Adonis Arms, I think he's going to do positive things for Texas Tech this year. You think about what he did last year at a, a lower level on the East Coast, right? Shot a high percentage from three, about mid-30s, right? Now he comes to Texas Tech, is asked to do a lot more in terms of the ball handling and being the primary ball handler for Texas Tech at times. And he's excelled at it. Yeah, there's been a couple of turnovers here and there. He had two today, but he also had five assists to lead the Red Raiders in that, or came in second, excuse me, behind Kevin McCuller, right? And those two guys are absolutely fun to watch together because – they really have a lot of the same tendencies game-wise, right? Like from three, Adonis Arms is a little bit better in terms of shooting the ball. But Kevin McCuller today shot pretty well from three. I mean, he went three for five. So there's that. But I don't know if Kevin McCuller is obviously going to shoot that high of a rate from here on out. But now the defenses have to trust him. And that's something that they haven't had to do for a long time when it came to Kevin McCullers in the sense that, Really, when you think of Kevin McCullough, you think of a guy that is a little small, but he can really play down low, is a solid passer, and is just a Swiss Army knife and can do everything for you on the basketball floor. But now he's adapted a little bit, and he can be that primary ball handler for you. He can be that point guard for you. He can also shoot from the outside enough where defenses have to rotate on him and allow him to use his vision because most of the time he's going to have guards that are smaller than him now on him and allows him to get the ball deep into the zones that Texas Tech struggled with early on in the year. Remember the Providence game? They couldn't beat the zone. And now Texas Tech has opportunities with arms, Warren, McCuller, O'Banner, Williams, Clarence Dendaldi's giving you good minutes. I mean, there is a lot of guys now in this rotation where typically moving forward and you're a team like Texas Tech, you want to shrink that rotation, right? I don't know where you shrink the rotation to now if you're Mark Adams when everybody comes back and healthy. And, and hopefully Malik Wilson comes back here pretty soon. I'm not confident that'll happen. I probably guess Oh, maybe mid-February from what I'm hearing. It was a pretty big, substantial knee injury that he had um, in terms of a scope. Terrence Shannon Jr., that's interesting to me. I don't know exactly where they're going to go with that in terms of the back. It feels like it's a three-day type situation. How does he feel after warm-ups, which is kind of scary, but also at the same time, at least it's not like a long, lingering you know, knee injury or anything like that. This is a back injury, so you could view it as worse, I guess. But Terrence Shannon Jr. has shown to be a very tough player, so I do expect him to just use these two weeks and everything like that, get ready for the Big 12 play. And again, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that you don't 
have that game on Saturday because it gives Terrence Shannon Jr. and Malik Wilson a little bit more recovery time without you losing a game in terms of not losing the game, but having to play a game and restarting that clock, if that makes sense in terms of the recovery. Now, for me moving forward, and again, Texas Tech, they have an absolute gauntlet. And for those that are watching right now, I'm super excited to announce this. He's unfortunately not on here right now. He might be on here a little later. I can tell you that. Um, he might be on here, but for those that follow Texas Tech men's basketball really, really closely, we will be having a third person on the show with Lyle and myself throughout the year, and that will be Chase Champlin from Red Raider Sports. He covers basketball and men's basketball over there for Red Raider Sports. He does their graphics over there, covers the team, does a really, really good job over there. And I'm excited to announce that he will be joining the podcast. We got the sign off on that earlier in the week. So he'll be kind of our insider guy for tech basketball is mostly mine, his opinion, and you know, a little bit of insider stuff here and there, but he's going to be up close and personal to this team, allowing us to really have an inside look at what's going on. He's already got a lot of following over on Twitter. If you haven't followed him already, be sure to go do that. It's Chase Champlin RRS. Be sure to go follow him over there. So I'm super excited that he will be joining us and everything. And Lyle will still be here. I don't know where he is right now. I guess he's got his kid and that's fine. Family first. I'm all about it on the holiday season, but my kids are two fur babies right now got two dogs if anybody's got some dogs let me know in the comment section i got a husky and then we call her a uh prairie dog but really let's just be honest about it she's a weenie dog that likes to sit up on her back legs that's what she is but let's get back to this in terms of the texas tech men's basketball as again i see some guys in here we got red raider mitch saying what's up rc we got wally in here here saying what's up are you nailing here with the emojis and saying nice about the chase stuff yeah i'm super excited about chase joining and everything like that should be a big addition to the podcast as we continue to grow which hopefully we're going to be doing as you know football season's going to be in the rear view mirror but trust us we'll be talking plenty of that but basketball season is coming fast in terms of big 12 play and we are excited to talk about that so when chase hops on here maybe we'll talk about our, you know, big 12 outlook for the Texas Tech Red Raiders. He might be on here today. He might be running a little late. It is one of those games and he's got a lot to do over for Red Raider sports, but we are excited that he will be joining the podcast and we will have potentially a podcast later on in the week where we talk about our big 12 outlook. If you missed this one today, but we got, what is up RC? We got KOB. I'm not going to lie. That might be my favorite nickname I've seen on here so far. Um, I'm just saying might just be, I don't know yet. I haven't decided. I need more people in the chat, but um, right now, KOB has got it. Looking at this right now, just looking at the schedule, and I'll give a little bit of my takes on what I think the Big 12 will look like in terms of where Texas Tech stacks going forward. You have Iowa State who, my God, did anybody see that coming? They were picked to finish last in the Big 12 and now are the number eight team in the country. I didn't see that coming. They have done a phenomenal job up there in Ames that we knew that they had a lot of talent. It was, was that first year coaching staff going to be able to get the most out of it? Or was it going to be one of those rebuilding years kind of like K-State had last year? Um, but no, they're really, really good. Do not get it twisted. That game on next Wednesday, January 5th, it's going to be super, super difficult. I'll tell you that because I think the Cyclones kind of mimic the Red Raiders in the sense that if you're looking for a team that maybe isn't identical to Texas Tech, but plays kind of the same defense, has a lot of similar sized athletes, kind of likes to play basketball the same way, Iowa State is that. They are that kind of team. And I thought maybe they would just be, you know, a little bit further down from Texas Tech. But no, that coaching staff has done a phenomenal phenomenal job um and iowa state number eight team in the country my goodness they have looked great then you play kansas at home hopefully a lot of the students get back for that game maybe a couple of recruits come in here we'll talk about that here in a little bit too you will have at least one and four star shooting guard rj jones he will be coming in kind of reminds me of a bradley beal maybe this name will resonate with people devin booker that's kind of who he reminds me of when i watch some of his tape more so brad Bradley Beal, but Devin Booker a little bit in this game as well. He will be in the 806 for the Kansas game. And then you go to Baylor on a Tuesday. So in a span of six days, think about this. 
you play the number eight, the number five, and the number one team in the country. That's wild. I mean, that is rough. And by the way, excuse me, Kansas is sixth. I apologize on that front. Kansas is six. So you go eight, six, and one to start out the Big 12 play. I'll be honest with you. If you win one game there, I'm feeling happy about it. And the reason being is this. You look what happens after that. And Texas Tech gets a game against Oklahoma State at home. Then you get Kansas State. Then you get West Virginia. I think you should win all three of those games no matter where you're playing. The only one on the road right there is in Manhattan against the Wildcats mixed in there is the Iowa state at home. I think you should win all three of those games against Oklahoma state, K state, West Virginia. And now if you can split with every one of those three teams, you start conference with Iowa state, Kansas and Baylor, you're fine. In my opinion, even if you go what two and four against them, you're fine because I think you can beat up on everyone else in this conference. right. You think about it. The biggest game of the year schedule wise is no doubt February 1st, and you will have most likely anyway, the way it's looking right now, you will have a potential five star recruit in the building for that Texas game when Coach Beard comes back to the 806 and KJ Lewis from Champlin out in El Paso, a longtime target of the Red Raiders. So you think about it in the sense of this. I'm okay with how the schedule breaks down for Texas Tech. Because here's the deal. You get Kansas out of the way entirely before the month of February starts. That's a big deal when you think about it, right? Baylor, you play a little bit further on in the year, but you think that you get two top 10 teams done and out of the way conference-wise before you even play Mississippi State in your last non-conference game. That's a pretty big deal if you're Texas Tech in the sense that later on in the schedule, you can get a little bit more momentum going into March which we all know is the goal in all of this. You end the year with, from the last five games of the year, you go down to Austin, and we all know that's a home court environment for the Red Raiders, like it or not, for that gaudy orange team down there in the South. Then you play Oklahoma at home, TCU and Fort Worth, okay? So you think about that. Your two road games, you basically have a home court advantage in that regard because you know you're going to have more fans down in Austin and you know you're going to have more fans in Fort Worth than the Horned Frogs. And then you play Kansas State at home and then you round out the year in Stillwater. And let's be honest, Oklahoma State's not going to have much to play for at that point because they can't go to the tournament. So maybe they view you as your tournament team, but also at the same time, it wouldn't shock me if at that point – They're just kind of going through the motions, and that's no disrespect to what's going on at Oklahoma State. I think they got the short end of the stick from the NCAA. Surprising enough, they didn't give the Blue Bloods anything, but Oklahoma State, there you go, right? That's just how the NCAA goes, I guess. But in all honesty, when you look at what Texas Tech has in terms of the schedule, I think it sets up beautifully for the Red Raiders, and I'm excited to see where it goes for Texas Tech for the sheer fact of what are you going to have And where are you going to be able to really prosper, I guess, in this in terms of your schedule? And I think the latter part is going to be that as I am about to get Lyle in here, taking his time to get in here is Lyle trying to get him in here right now. There's the man, the myth, the legend rocking the level land stuff right there. My man, how are you doing? Hey, man, blessed to be in your presence. I like the hat, too. It's fresh. You got it. Fresh. Are you a are you a um, 3D double T guy? Or are you more of the old school? Mm, I'm in the middle. I think I think I go with the more 3D. I, I like to look at myself as modern, sleek, you know, stylish, you oh, know, all those gotcha. type things. Big granite countertop kind of guy. Yeah, no doubt about that. Yeah, no I doubt. got you. Yeah, I, I think um, for me, like in terms of like, I'm trying to think if, if I'm modern or if I'm just kind of like somewhere in the middle. By the way, there's the. 3D logo for Texas Tech on the on the mug. No doubt. There we go. Um, I don't know where I am. Like, I don't know what my style is. I am a soon-to-be 28-year-old man that has no concept or sense of but style. But they say the 30s are the new 20s. That's what I heard. Oh, they do? That's what I heard. You know? I, I didn't get the tweet about it. I guess it didn't come through in the DMs or the mentions. Being in my 30s, I had, I had to go with it. I had to ride with it, you know? Yeah, and, uh, I'm right there with you. I'm right you know? there with you. Okay. I can get behind it. Yeah, no, for sure. I, it's just one of those things where I'm just trying to figure out when the style or my concept of it actually happens. 
because it hasn't yeah. happened yet. So I'm just trying to figure out life at this point. But I guess aren't we all to some degree? I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you too. When you get married and have kids, man, the style, like I said, the style goes out the window. My kids <laughs> get on me all the time. I told them I got a dad card. So once you get that dad card, you're free to, uh, you know, you're free to go. I had a, a conversation with uh, Fulani not too long ago, and we were talking about minivans because you know he has four kids. So oh, we're talking about minivans. Minivan guy? No. Definitely not, but I will SUV? say SUV. Yeah, I, I'm a SUV. I'm a. I have a truck. My wife has an SUV, but I'm more oh. of a. Uh, uh, what flow is good nowadays? You know. Okay. So I would. I wouldn't be opposed to it. You know. I got you. No, you I mean, knock it till you try it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I remember my grandma and grandpa. They bought one of those old school vans that had like a TV at the top of it. Mm-hmm. You remember what I'm talking and like the seat yeah. each just went all the way back. And as a kid, I literally thought this was the greatest thing in life itself. Yeah. And now wow. I'm over here thinking, wow, that is not what I want in life. But at the same time, I have no kids. I just have, right. you know, some fur kids, I guess, with some dogs. But <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, my offense coordinator got one. He drove over to my house yesterday in the minivan. Loved it. Had the TVs rolling with no kids. And I was like, what are you doing, brother? And so, you know. I go knock it side track. It would be great though, like if you just want to take like a break on a long road trip, you know, like hey kids, get in the back. I'm gonna go watch some Monsters Inc. Right. And then if you got kids, it keeps them quiet for at least at least three hours. So and you don't have to give them the phone either. That's the that's the thing that scares me the most. Some of these parents are like, what are we doing? Like that's that's some that takes some stones, if you know what I mean, to hand over the phone to a kid. Yeah. I can't lie. I got to be honest. Uh, my daughter has my phone right now as we speak. So, uh, you know, sometimes. Does that worry you? Does that worry you? It, nah, you, you know, now with the new new technology, you can lock down pretty much everything. But, you know, the only thing is you just got to watch out. You know, YouTube is supposed to be kids YouTube, but sometimes they be having some stuff on there, man. You know, YouTube. I need yeah. to check that out, kids YouTube. So, as, we're, you know, I, as we're live on YouTube right now. Yeah. Y'all got to gotta watch that, you know. Uh, well, right for the there, most part, you know, you put on a little Netflix for them. They don't, they don't, you know, my son put on PJ mask. On. Oh, okay. I can give, see, the thing is with me, like, I don't know how that works in terms of like, just being uh, like from the Netflix side of it. I know there's that kid aspect, right? Like you can have the kids from their side in terms of just going in and everything, but I'm still scared. Like, somehow they'll figure out a way to get back out of it. And just somehow you're going to, you know, have some rom-com on there that you're just like, okay, you can't be seeing that until you're like 18. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. They know how to work the phone. That's for sure. They know. Yeah. There's much smarter than we are um, yeah. when it comes to technology. My son's two years old and busted in on my lock code. So either I'm not very smart or he's super smart. I'm, I'm going to go with he's super smart. Um, I was going to say both, but I didn't want to rub it in. It's the holiday season. I didn't want to do that. You know, I was just like, you know, Code had a lot of zeros in there. I will will say that, um, but I didn't think. Got to do what you got to do sometimes with those zeros and everything. Yeah. Got to switch it up. You uh excited about today? Oh uh, yeah, I've been watching football all day. Uh, what you, you know, watch? Watch. So you've been? Did, did you Houston. did you watch the Houston game? I did. I did. I was what I was the, happy for them. What What was the? Listen, I'm glad they won. Right. No doubt about it. Just because every day the SEC loses, that just makes my life better. Um, but it's your boy, Dana, down there. What the hell was that play call on the interception? I don't know, man. You know, I think uh, I think he was having a little fun, you know, uh, 12 and uh, what that? What were they? 11 and one or 11 and two were they or 12? Yeah, 11 and two. The only two losses two? they have was in their conference championship game to Cincinnati and then. This other team that plays tonight against Mike Leach, I, we don't really yeah. talk about them much, though. Yeah, you know, I don't know, I don't know about all that, but you know, they do what they do. But I think he's just feeling himself a little bit, having fun. I think, honestly, this is the first time I've seen in a while that I felt like he was actually having fun. I saw him out there talking to kids when they messed up, and you know, uh, Hogs is an emotional. He's an emotional dude when he coaches, so it was good to see. Um, it was good to see him kind of relax today. You know, he's still always on edge, but it was good to see him relax and just look like he was having fun. So, uh, like I said, I was happy for him. You know, we got Brandon Jones, his offensive coordinator from Tech, a Tech guy, played at Tech. So, yeah, uh, 
you know, I always root for them. And, and then, you know, they got a receivers coach. I coach one of my favorite kids. Um, his name's the kill short. So he's a man, he's a, he's a real one. So uh, I was happy for those guys, but um, Auburn looked pretty bad. Um, I know they had a lot of people opting out and coaches changes, but, um, it me. but that's the SEC. I say all the time is, you know, beside those top three teams, I mean, they're, they're, to me, they're equal to the big 12. Like I will say Alabama, Georgia, um, they're probably better. Not probably, they are better than any big 12 team, but, um, I still feel if, if our top teams played them, it wouldn't be a massacre. Um, but I do feel like everyone yeah. else is equal in the SEC. Everyone thinks the SEC is just head over heels over Big 12, and it's not. Besides the top two teams, um, you know, LSU in the past, maybe three. I mean, everybody else is equal. Yeah. It, it's it's super interesting to me, too, because, like, when I, I was growing up, same for you, too, because we're not that far in age and everything. Like, players didn't opt out, right? Like, they didn't opt out of bowl games, you know? No. Um, so we really got to see the whole experience. And I don't think there's anything wrong with um, – you know, opting out of a bowl game or anything like that. You got to do what's best for your family. I get it. It upsets the fans and everything, but it is what it is. It's a business decision. I'm okay with that um, in the long run. But mm -hmm. the bowl season just feels like, especially these last two years with COVID, it's completely different. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but the UCLA and NC State game got nixed yeah. tonight because of COVID. Because apparently they had one healthy, non-positive testing D lineman for NC State. Yeah. Come on. Are you telling me you don't want to run a what? One, six, three? Come on. Mm -hmm. Everybody's running that defense. Yeah. One, seven, three? Everybody's running that kind of defense nowadays. Isn't that what y'all are running out there with the Lobos? No doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. I just, I don't know, man. I just, I, I wish that they would not allow them to do that. I know it's a business decision, but. Um, the opting out part. Yeah, I really don't like it. Uh, I, I respect it. I understand it because I would have done it. You know, I think that's the thing. Like, people get out here and say, oh, man, I can't believe that. But if it was you and it was $15 million on the table, um, then I would do it too. But I wish it was like a guaranteed. I used to tell kids when I was at West Virginia, um, I had a kid that uh, was going to not come back. But it's not a guaranteed thing. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I wish they had it to where if you're a guaranteed top 10 pick, you can opt out. Other than that, you got to play um, just because I think it takes away um, from the whole college experience, from the team, uh, from the whole bowl. I mean, like it's not bowl games anymore because the best players aren't playing. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was evident today when, you you know, Auburn, they had five, five guys opt out. And so yeah. I think it takes away from the bowl game. I think they should make them do that. Like the NBA makes them, what does it play two years now? I think they should have to play the bowl game. Um, and uh, I think that's something that they should do because that makes a big difference. That's what you play for. I don't know if people know that out there, but bowl games is what we played for. It's not, you know, of course you want to win conference championships, but the, the thing we play for is what's the best bowl game we can go to. And I can tell you every bowl game I went to and everything we did at those bowl games, but I can necessarily tell you, Hey, in my freshman year, this is, this is how many yards this person had, or this is, you know, so that's, that's the whole goal is, what best bowl game, best gifts, and, uh, you know, and, and try to get that bowl game victory. So, I don't know. What was the best gift you got at a bowl game? Man, uh, the best, it was a uh, cotton bowl, and I got a, no, I'd say the best, it was two bowl games, cotton bowl and Alamo bowl. So, okay. cotton bowl, I got a 32-inch flat screen TV, uh, or it might have been 42-inch, I don't know what it was. And then uh, I got an Xbox uh, at the Alamo. And actually, my favorite was Alamo Bowl, the best bowl game I went to. Cotton Bowl with their neck, neck and neck, but the Alamo Bowl with, um, I don't know if you've ever been there, but San Antonio, just downtown, our hotel. Oh, it's awesome. Downtown. Loved it. Like, we loved it. Um, and so I, I'd have to say that. But, I mean, every year it depends. Just like I said, when I was at West Virginia, we went to the uh, Liberty Bowl, which they played in, playing tonight, like I told you. Yeah. I think they gave us a sweatsuit and a watch. And I'm like, hold on, man. I just got a TV, Xbox, sound, <laughs> and y'all giving us a watch. Life comes at you fast. <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I still got beef with the Liberty Bowl. Um, but they did do some cool stuff. We edited the, um, what's it called? The House of Blues, I believe it was. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was, that was pretty The cool. original one, I believe. Yeah, it was, it was really, it was really cool to see that. And they took us by, uh, like, Martin Luther King Hotel and 
uh, hard rock. You go to Elvis's house. house? Yeah, they took us to Elvis's house. And so that's the cool thing about bowl games. And I think people, um, I don't know if people know that out there, but that's the cool thing is they have a schedule set up for you to do and different places, you know, they offer you different things. So the bowl gifts were horrible there, but you know, the historic stuff we got to do was yeah. amazing, you know, minus then going out at night, you know, like we had to have a sheriff with us and certain areas you could not go. And I respect that because I'm not going, I told Dana, I'm not going to get anybody, uh, you know what I'm saying? That's in the hood. Uh, that's, that's not supposed to be, I'm, I'm yeah. out on that. You can fire me, do what you must. Uh, so, but it was an overall, um, food wise, great experience, uh, at the bowl game. And then, you know, and it was Mike Tomlin's uh, last year at AM. and uh, and yeah. so it was wild, man. They were actually, um, they're actually out the night of the game because I got sent out to uh, go make sure our kids wasn't out, a And M kids everywhere, and so it was it was wild, man. man. And uh, they actually talked crazy to Coach Hoverson before the game. It was they were a wild bunch, and they beat us. So it was a crazy time. It, I, it's funny to me, like. Cause like I'll just get random DMs sometimes from people, and I got one today, um, in the sense like funny enough, um, from Coach maybe you know him, Christopher Morton. He was the coach for Mason Tharp uh, at the high school level, and he's a tight end now for Texas Tech. So he DM'd me today. Um, hopefully he doesn't mind me shouting him out or anything like that. Um, but he was like, "Man, I'm in Memphis. Obviously he's there to see Mason and everything like that." But you would be shocked at how many people in the past two weeks have asked me to rank the barbecues of Texas, mm -hmm. Kansas City, mm -hmm. and Memphis. And now I want to put you on the spot with it because we know which one's number one. We don't, we don't have to talk about number one. Texas is number one. We know that. But what's number two? I've actually never had Kansas City barbecue. Oh, well, so number two is easy for you. It's Memphis because yeah. you've had it. Yeah, I can't. Okay. I cannot lie. I've never had Kansas City. I've uh, had um all three, and it's interesting. Think? It's like the way that I would describe it is Texas is the best. It's not close, right? Like it's it's superior in every aspect of it. Absolutely. But Kansas City, it depends on your mood. Like Kansas City is definitely a little bit more heavy. Memphis, I feel like it's heavy. Don't get me wrong. It's barbecue. But I feel like I could actually go and be productive with the rest of my day after eating Memphis barbecue. Mm. You know, with Texas barbecue, you eat one meal, you better have your spot on the couch. That's your spot. And you're probably not moving for a little while. Absolutely. You know, Memphis, you can move around a little bit. It's a little heavy. Don't get me wrong, because it is barbecue. But at the okay. same time, at least you can move. Um, mm. It's also not sweet. It's a little bit more vinegary. It's got that little, you know, South flavor to it, which I love the South flavor um, personally, but I can understand how people don't like it. Have you um, ever had white barbecue? Oh, yeah. In Memphis. It's good. I've never oh, heard. yeah. Yeah. I, it's not I've like one of those things where I'm going to covet it. Like, I'm not going to go out there and be like, you know what? I want white barbecue today. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. But if it's like offered to me, like somebody already made it, yeah, I'll eat it. It's pretty good. Okay. I'm not a mayo guy, so it scares me. On the I'm not a mayo guy either. I don't like mayo at all. It don't taste like mayo? No, it really doesn't. It's kind of like um, spicy mayonnaise. Mm. Like, I'll, I'm weird. Like, I will not eat regular mayonnaise, but if me it's too. spicy, I'll eat it. Me too. Sushi all the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do that, but um, it doesn't taste like that because you can make it, you know, spicy um, white barbecue and everything like that, and you're good to go. Um, oh. Yeah, so that's kind of my opinion on it, but you mentioned it. It's the best time of the year right now, in my opinion, because outside of, funny enough, Christmas Eve, there's sports on all day. And Texas mm -hmm. Tech is part of that, too. Basketball obviously played earlier today. But the biggest thing right now is the bowl game for sure. Um, and we talked about it on the last podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe right here. And now we're on Spotify. I don't even know if you realize that. Did you see that? Hey, I did. I, I ain't going to lie. I took a picture, sent it to my mom, told her we made it. Sent well, me and RC made it. Yeah, everybody can get a Spotify, but sometimes it feels a lot bigger than that. You know what I mean? And we're on Spotify. We appreciate everybody listening. Go search that over there and get some, uh, you know, subscribers on that. We'll be posting polls and everything over there. But Texas Tech goes into this game tonight, and I'm sure you've heard by now or at least seen the video of what Mike Leach said um, yesterday, which was whatever. It's fine. It's to be expected. But we'll just talk about the game side of this because 
I do have it. Well, before we get into the game side of this, I have a question for you. Which one are you taking over under 27 and a half times? They mentioned Mike Leach is the former head coach of Texas Tech. Oh, they're over that. But but I do have to say this. I, I got to say this. And um, I know Texas Tech people are going to be a little, little upset about this, but I, I got to get this off my chest. Okay. Uh, you know, since we hit Spotify, you know, I got to up it. Uh, but anyways, I have a, uh, a uh, older gentleman that has uh, done a lot for me um, in the coaching world as far as stuff is helping and stuff like that. So I uh, asked Coach Leach if he would send me something uh, so I can send him for it. He graduated from Mississippi State. Great man. Loves Mississippi State. So I said, hey, Coach Leach, uh, I want to get him something for Christmas. Do you mind signing something for me? You know, I'll send it to you. And uh they hooked me up, man. Coach Leach hooked me up with a ball to send to my man and a hat. So I got wow, that's shout, awesome. I got to shout out Coach Leach. Um, you know, just taking care of former players and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, that that dude is gonna he's gonna love it. I think his name is Mr. Trippy. I think he's about 85. He looks like he's 26, but um <laughs> he's gonna be souped up. So I I had to shout out Mike, you know, uh for that because I think that's pretty cool. Uh, that's a well-deserved shout out too. That, yeah, that, that's a good to, one. That, that's one thing. Like, I, I think people, and again, I was arguing, not arguing with a couple people on Twitter, but just reminding them. And we've talked about this on prior podcasts too. Like recruits do not commit to schools, right? They commit to coaches 99% of the time. Oh, and yeah. live an example. Yeah. I, you, And that's no disrespect to Texas Tech or anything, but you've come to love Texas Tech, obviously, afterwards once you got there. But if you're saying that you committed to Texas Tech before that, you're probably lying. And obviously you didn't say that, but you commit to a coach. And that's the thing um, that people, I think, forget that, yeah, you can go in there and you can say, hey, I'm committing to Texas Tech. But in all reality, for you, for example, you probably committed to your wide receiver coach or you committed to the you know, quarterback or whatever, like you saw something there, you committed because maybe a player was there that you wanted to play with. What probably it's the offensive coordinator or your position coach. That's yeah. probably yeah. what it comes down to. No doubt. I think it's one of two things, honestly. I think it's, uh, like you said, a coach, and you know, or I think it's an opportunity for some people. That's all they get. You know, like for me, example, that's the best opportunity I got to play at that level. So uh, who else know, did I, you get recruited by? Or uh, my, so I mean, for football, nobody. Uh, as far as like that high level um, basketball, I got a um, Arizona State offer. Um, and the crazy thing was James Harden was actually my host. And I didn't realize it was James Harden until you take to the strip club. Ten years later, I had to decline, man. You know, my mom was like, <laughs> had to decline, man. If my mom would have found out, she would have been at the strip club with us. So I was like, it's a no go for me, James. But I didn't really. But he, wa- but he wanted to take you there. Yeah, bro, it's a lot he wanted to do, and I just couldn't do it. I know my mom <laughs> every Sunday, brother. I had to say, "Tell hey James, I can't go with you. If you want to go, you must go on your own." So <laughs> I didn't even realize it. Uh, you know that was him. And then uh, for track, you know, I could have went anywhere for track. So it was um, it was a cool experience. And, and like I said, Texas Tech was my best opportunity. I felt football was my best opportunity to go, as well as my quarterback. My high school quarterback went there. My high school running back went there. So. Um, you know, I played uh, my high school running back. We actually played on the same team since I was three. I went to school with Pot since I was five years old. So it was just a good situation overall. But I think that's the two things. You go for a coach um, or you go uh, for an opportunity. And actually a crazy story, speaking on recruiting, I actually got recruited by two people, uh, Coach Dykes um, and then Coach Brown. His name is Ron Brown. I don't know if a lot of people remember that. True Tech people will probably remember him, but he played in the NFL, Coach DBs. Um, yep. and he actually came to, to um, I tell my kids all the time, you recruits out there listening, play multiple sports. Um, it helps. Uh, but anyways, he came to watch me play basketball uh, in high school. So he came to, to, to watch me play basketball, came to eat dinner the next day. Uh, at, he came Friday to watch me play, Saturday he ate dinner. Uh, then he drove back home went to the rec center to play basketball and he actually had a massive heart attack and passed away on the next day. So it was crazy. My recruiting experience with coach, uh, coach Brown, uh, like anybody that knows him knows he was a, he's the real deal though. He was a, he was a cool dude. So it was a, you know, it's kind of like connection 
uh, I think like I said, opportunities, coaches, but also things that happen within that. So um, like I said, he got a lot of us in my class. Um, and those that remember him know how good of a recruiter he was. I, I don't remember how long he was there, but he was just a soft spoken dude. But they, you know, I want to say he was there like 12 years, 13 he years. He was I, maybe I'm making that number and pulling it up at a thin air, but I feel like that was the right, like that, it's in that range. Yeah, I think he was there for a while, but him and Coach Dykes were, like I said, the two guys that, yeah, you know, talked to me. But he was a, uh, I think it's just like connections to that people, you know, like we talk about all the time. When it comes to recruits, people don't understand location, what's your jersey, you know, who the coach is, all that stuff plays into it, you know, like, you know, same for like Link. I don't think people understand, like Link was a good recruiter in Norman, and now he's going to L.A. So, like, people don't understand what comes with L.A. What comes It's a little easier to recruit out there. Yeah, what comes with that is, you know, you might go to a movie premiere on your official visit. You, you might go to, you know what I'm saying, the hottest club in yeah. L.A. and be next to you know, Jay-Z and, and P. Diddy, you, you never know who's out there. And that's the, yeah. the difference that people don't understand. When you come to Lubbock, um, and like I said, I, I know a lot of people disagree. I still think it's very hard to recruit here. Um, but and that's just because of what comes with it. Like, we don't have, you know, like, so even at Houston, like, you know, um, uh, keeping up with Dana and some of those guys that I've coached that are there. You know, like, last time, one of my kids that I coached in high school was actually um, – about five years ago, he went down there and uh, he sat with Waka Flocka. Uh, I forgot who he sat, two other rappers, Slim Thug and somebody else. So, you know, okay. as a kid, you know, you come to Texas Tech um, and, you, and, and and it's a great time. And then you go to Houston, you're sitting with Slim Thug and then go hang out with Waka Flocka. For for kids, that's a, that's a major deal when you could go to, like I said, you click on Apple Music and say, hey, man, this is Slim Thug, you take pictures. So, uh, I think yeah. a lot of that has to do with like the city of Houston. No, no telling who may be in Houston. You may see Drake. They may take a kid out to go see Houston, Drake, and Vegas. And he may just be there. And so that makes a big, big difference. Um, I know we flipped two kids one time because Snoop Dogg was here. And uh, I happened to, you know, know Snoop and the recruits I had as actually. Wait, you like, happen to know Snoop? Don't don't do, do that. that. Don't do that. Uh, don't just do that. A little bit. Don't man. do that. Don't do don't 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 do that. Don't do that. Don't gloss over that. Don't I, I don't be humble full, now. I can't take full credit for that though. I can't. Take no, don't credit. don't don't do that now. Don't do that. Don't don't just no. you know casually slide that in the middle of a conversation and think that I'm not going to hear it. Don't do that. Don't do that. When it's not like we're talking about one of the greatest rappers and icons of our generation or anything. Hey man, you hang out with that dude, you wouldn't even know. So he, uh, so how did this come to be? We can talk about Texas Tech football here in like a minute, but I need to hear about this. How do you know Snoop Dogg? So my dad is from Compton, California. Okay. Uh, I have a half brother from Compton, California. Okay. And so them dudes are just, you know, being where they're from. Those guys, like I said, they interact throughout the, throughout Compton pretty regularly. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I've met the game, um, you know, at my grandmother's house, my uncle's house. They, you know, but to them, it's just like yeah, it's Sunday you know, afternoon and one of the greatest like, rappers of all time. And I was like, you're Snoop Dogg. And my uncle's looking at me like, you better stop acting like a, you know, a group. A fanboy or something. Yeah. And I was like, I am. I am that. Whatever you say, I am. I am that. I, I do want to <laughs> shake your hand. And no, I don't want to partake in your your extracurricular activities. But I do love the fact of what you do. Um, but I think it's just a little bit of, you know, above my level. Um I, I don't want to okay. know where I'm at, you know, be on planet Earth. But, you know, just meeting them, but just seeing kids, I flipped like Eric Stevens was going to Minnesota. We hung out, met him, and flipped the Texas Tech. So I, I think that stuff is like people forget and, and don't take into consideration uh, about when coming. Because, like I said, if you're from Dallas, to get back home to Dallas from here is six hours. You know, you can go to TV. Well, well I'll say this it may be six hours for you. That's true. It's not six I, hours for me. I do drive I, like an old Because man. most of the time, like, yeah, the speed limit is a suggestion when you're going that fast. You want to say hi? Come say hi. Say hi yeah, come say hi to everybody. Me. Hello. Say hello to everybody. Hi. Everyone. Who's winning tonight, Texas Tech or Mississippi State? Oh, she kept Ooh. it on it. Hey, we love to hear it. We love to hear it. Mississippi State? Okay, I ain't mad at that. All right. Hey, keeping it honest. That's what we love. That's what we love. I'm okay with that. Hey. I'm not mad at all. I'm not mad at all. Give me five. You gotta be, you gotta be a tough critic about it sometimes. There we go. All right. Well, 
Okay, so I've learned a couple of things here. Your children, smart, because they agreed with me. Um, I'll give my prediction later, but I do agree. Um, and then, you know Snoop Dogg. That's just a yeah, casual yeah. point to throw in there. Um, but also at the same time, I have 43 people we have to shout out on this show today. That's what's up. We got 43 people? Yeah, we, I have to shout them out because they literally went over to my Twitter and gave scores for Texas Tech. So I have to shout out all of That's them. Rough. Oh, yeah. Take your time. Take your time. Here we go. So you tell me when uh, – you tell me when to stop. I'll probably go in fives here. Okay. Okay. Um, but just tell me when one of these is just ridiculous. Okay. If any of them are ridiculous. We'll uh, start with one of the other Texas Tech podcasts. Shout out to them, the Ra- Ramblin' Raiders podcast. Good dudes hey. over there. They're in Houston. Um, they think Texas Tech wins 38-35. Then we got Mark Desick. He says Texas Tech 47, Mississippi State 3. Mark, that is blasphemous, Wait, and it's homerish. Wow. It's homerish, but Mark will allow it. Will allow it. It's a homer three. take. Yeah, he, it's a homer take. It's a homer take. Let's be real about it. It's a homer take. I don't think Mike's ever scored three points. No, he did. He yes. has. Yeah, in the SEC. Yeah. Oh, wow. I think he got shut out. I could be wrong on that. I know he's, he's at least scored three. We're definitely on the next podcast going to have to uh, – we're going to have to figure that out. To zero points, Michael? I, I don't know. At that point, Mike Leach is in the rear view. You know, for me, it's – Mike Leach is in the rear view after that. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's uh, all about a certain, uh, you know, let's go type man or hire McGuire, if you know what I'm saying. Right. Um, and then we got Emery. He does another podcast, Locked on Texas Tech. Him and Ryan Mainville, two really good dudes. He keeps it probably realistic here. 41-24 Mississippi State. Then we got Rob – or Ron, excuse me, Bergen Guns Up. Oh, wow. Like Ron Burgundy, but Ron That's Bergen clever. Guns Up. So I'm That's down for that. That's clever. Um, if anybody's watching right now, Leave your comment here on YouTube and we'll shout you out as well. Um, Leave your score for the game tonight. We'll give ours here in a little bit. Um, And then the last one before we get into a little bit of the talk is from Richard at Rich in Austin. Um, Tech is in a tough position with a freshman quarterback and a coaching staff in transition. Meanwhile, Mississippi State seems pretty intact Texas Tech 26, Mississippi State 41, a rare occurrence. Hey, hoping I'm my, dead wrong. If that's my my boy Rich, shout out to you, man. I, I don't know. I think he lives in Austin and went to Tech with me. If that's you, Rich, shout out to you, brother. Hope all is well. Rich P? I, I'm not sure. I don't know what his, uh, his, uh, his name is, but I had a friend that, uh, uh, you know, did a lot of stuff at, at Tech and was a good dude. So if it's you, Rich. Shout out to you, which I, th- I think it is because, like I said, he's logged in, um, you know, supporting. So he's that type of person. So shout that's out what, to him. And that's what we love. Shout out to Rich anyway. Yeah, there we go. And then we got Carson Freeman in here right now. Carson is always showing love on Twitter. Appreciate you, Carson. He's got 31-14 Mississippi State. Um, I do want to bring this up because we previewed it a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit more in depth on this because this is a – one of those matchups for me when you look at Texas Tech and the more that I look into it, it's it's not impossible, right? Because it's football. Anything can happen, um, right? That That's just the nature of it. But when you think about everything that is against Texas Tech right now, mm. isn't it – like even if you want to say this was 50-50, right? Like it's got to swing over – to Mississippi State side pretty heavily just because of the guys that Texas Tech is missing, the transition they're going through. I mean, listen, give give them a ton of credit, especially the kids, like in terms of the players and everything. And I, I shouldn't call them kids. They're close to my age. Grown men. They're grown men. Um, like, give them credit. Every man, woman in that building that had anything to do with the program, give them credit because they did not quit on the season in a really a lose-lose situation, Right. But there's only so much you can do in a situation where you are facing a team that is one of the best passing teams in the country, the number three passing team in the country. You have arguably the worst secondary in the Big 12 outside of Kansas. And then you also are losing guys like a Eric Izakama, who, by the way, you broke news on the first podcast we ever did together. I don't know if you knew that, but um, listen, Eric, 
you know, may have broken the news himself on Twitter. But if you were subscribed to the Back to 12 podcast, you would have known what? 10 days before everybody else that he was gone as Lyle's get that. See, I like, I like how now we're a little bit into this and you're like the humbleness is going away a little bit. That's what we love to see. Not, don't be arrogant or anything, but just sh- you can be right. And you can let the people know, you know what I mean? It's all right. Um, but no, like you, you were Texas tech and you were losing a lot of pieces. And to be fair, Mississippi state is losing arguably the best tackle in college football and Charles cross because he opted to leave and go train for the NFL draft, but just on paper. And again, I know this game is not played on paper, so I'm not trying to make that argument, but just even watching these teams and watching film on both of them, this is going to be difficult as hell for Texas tech to pull this off. Right. Uh, I, th- I think, you know, in a different aspect, the two things is for one, you got guys that have been hungry to play that get the opportunity uh, for one. And then you have coaches that are leaving. Uh, so yeah. if the coaches are leaving, they're liable to do more um, things that they normally wouldn't do. So like I say, Cumbie is a head coach. Um, coach Patterson is a head coach. And so for them, they might do some stuff that they normally wouldn't do if they were coming back, but they have nothing to lose. They know they have nothing to lose. They can't get fired. And I just think when you have the, you know, the ability to kind of be free and they always have the ability to be free. But when you're fighting for your job, fighting for your family, it's always in the back of your mind. But tonight they have nothing that they can uh, that they have to fight for. They have a job like both of them are moving on to better positions. So tonight is a fun deal for them. It's not a you know, uh, it's not one of those things where oh we got to win to keep my job. They're good. So I think that's the thing that helps them tonight is they're out there free falling like after tonight they move forward to something that, you know, is a lifetime goal for those guys. The same for these players that are like, hey, um, you know, Coach McGuire is going to be watching tonight. Tonight's my turn to show up and show out. So I think that's the advantage that Texas Tech has tonight with the free will of those guys getting to step in. So I've always said that to people. uh, When those guys that are opt out or those guys don't do what they're supposed to, it's somebody behind that's been waiting a long time to get in those, those positions. So that's what I give the advantage to Texas Tech, as well as um, guys on Mississippi State trying to um, do a lot for Leach. You know, this is important for Leach, so we got to make sure that he wins. So I think Texas Tech has nothing to lose. I think Mississippi State has everything to lose, and I think that's where the advantage goes to Texas Tech. Do you think – you mentioned it in the sense that, like, obviously – you can lay all your cards out. If you're Sonny Cumbie here, you can lay all your cards out. If you're Patterson, like how early do you think they go to just maybe not trick plays, but plays that you normally wouldn't see maybe during the middle of the season or anything like that? Because as you mentioned, what, what do they have to hide now at this point? Like, what do you have to hide? You have nothing to hide. Your playbook is gone from at least Texas tech at this point. You might as well just throw everything out there that you possibly can and see if you can somehow – and I'll be honest with you, it would very much surprise me if Texas Tech won this game because, listen, I'm a big odds guy, and I know that players don't look at odds and everything. You leave it out on the field. I know that, and coaches are the same way. But Vegas has tall buildings for a reason. I'll say that, and they have a lot of them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Ten-point dogs, that's rough if you're Texas Tech. And I think Texas Tech is going to compete – and I think they're going to be in it long term in this game, but I do think Mississippi State kind of probably pulls away. But how much does the trick play factor and maybe Coach Leach trying to prove a little bit too much play into this game? Or if, if it does it at all, does it at all? Just It's something that's came to my mind this week in the sense that you saw the press conference yesterday, and I don't want to say Mike Leach made it about him yesterday, even though it kind of felt like he did um, in some degrees, but not the whole time, right? But, like, how much of it in the sense of where it's just like, well, forget it. Let's just throw everything out there on the table. Let the cards fall where they may. That's what Texas Tech is going to do. But Coach Leach is going to come in there and be like, I am going to prove to this school that he thinks that owes him money, this, that, and the other. He is just going to try and run up the score, right? Like, how much – where is that point where it's like, okay, what side prevails, if that makes sense in terms of that argument? No, nah, that makes sense. But just the thing that Leach is going to do, he, he's a stubborn dude. He always been. He's going to do what he does. He's not going to do a trick play. He's not coming in here with trick plays. He's going to run mesh. 
Uh, he's going to run corner post. He's going to run mesh. He's going to run mesh, and he's going to run mesh. Um, and that's what he's going to do. What's he going to run after mesh? He's going to run mesh again. Mesh, oh, shallow, okay. Mesh, Got shallow. it. So Got it. That's the thing. He's stubborn and, and feels like he's – um so good at what he does he's going to do what he's going to do so he's not doing extra stuff he might throw one trick play in there but he, you're not going to see you think Sonny Cumbie does though yeah why not I that, 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 that's kind of my my point of it like I I'm kind of thinking like from the Mike Leach perspective of is he going to be the stubborn ass and trust me you would know way better than me um and Mike Leach is going to be stubborn regardless but is he going to be stubborn in the sense of I'm going to prove to you that my key concepts work and they can work over and over and over again? Or is he going to be stubborn in the sense of, I am going to embarrass you? And yeah. I think that there's two ways to go about it. He could embarrass you by just running his basic concepts. That's what he going but, he could, but he could also embarrass you by just like, oh, you think I'm going to run mesh, mesh, mesh? Well, I'm not going to run mesh, mesh, mesh three times in a row. I'm going to sprinkle in a trick play there or something like that. Like, that's kind of what I'm thinking. But he's, he's, he's going to run what he does. Like I said, that's okay. – uh, that's what he's in. I can guarantee you I put a whole paycheck on it that he, he'll do what he's going to do. Um, and I, I, I think that's the advantage, like I said, for Texas Tech because they have nothing to lose. Like there's yeah. nothing, there's no one to tell Cumbie not to do nothing. And the Cumbie can do whatever he pleases. Coach Patterson can. So if they want to blitz, uh, you know what I'm saying, nine people or eight people every play, they can. They, there's not going to be a, you need to do this because this is it for them. Like I said, this is a yeah. fun deal. And, and I think it allows you to be loose. Like like I talked about when Link took over at the, the Alamo Bowl, like he had nobody telling him what not to do, what not to, you know what I'm saying? Like as, as Cumbie is an offensive guy. So, I mean, he knows the defense. Of course, he's a very smart dude. But what is he telling the defensive coordinator that he's going to be a head coach somewhere else tomorrow? Like this game ends tonight at 12 o'clock. He is gone and he's the head coach of La Tech. Coach Patterson is the head coach of ACU at 12 o'clock tonight. Um, so I think that's the advantage for Texas Tech because like I said, there's nothing to lose. There's no one to tell him no. You know, what's Coach McGuire going to do, get mad? Uh, no, I think not because it doesn't matter what he has to say. Uh, so I think uh, for Texas Tech, that's the advantage. I think Leach is going to that's what Leach is going to do, what he does. That's what he always does. Now, is it going to be hard to stop? Absolutely. But they know, uh, you know, they have the keys tonight on what Leach is going to do, and they know what Leach is going to do. Cumby, as well as anybody knows what Leach is going to do, and it's not going to change. So I think uh, that's the advantage Texas Tech has. Now, athletes and all that other stuff, you know, do we have the advantage? Absolutely not. But Cumby knows um, – Cumbie knows everything he's going to do, you know. Like, when I was at West Virginia, we played Texas Tech. I knew every signal that Cliff called. Um, and, you know, don't be mad at me, Texas Tech fan, but I knew every single thing that he called. This is the same. The Red Raider, uh, the Air Raid, Mike Leach stuff, it's pretty similar. You can change it, but it's pretty, pretty similar if you really, really know it. So, I think they have an advantage for knowing. They're going to know what he's going to do. The question is, can they stop? Gosh. Yeah, I, for me, like – I'm super interested in the sense of the first two drives for Texas Tech, I think will tell us a lot. Like I really do in the sense of what Donovan Smith are we going to get? Are we going to get the Iowa State Donovan Smith where the moment wasn't too big? Or are we going to get that Oklahoma State one where, and it's not fair to compare the Oklahoma State defense to the Mississippi State one. That's just not fair um, to Oklahoma State because Oklahoma State has an historically great Big 12 defense. But which one are you going to get in terms of Donovan Smith, right? Like, which one are you going to and, – and that's going to be big for Texas Tech to pull off this what would be an upset, just if you look at the odds um, and everything like that. Let me shout out some of these people in the chat real quick. They put their um, score predictions up there. Before I do that, Combo Cole said would be huge for, right a, for us to get a win tonight. Yeah, absolutely. And then we've got, I think, Salty – listen – Red Raider Mitch, I'll give it to you since he's not there. I think Salty Ass Leach runs it up, 52-27. Then we got Combo Cole, 34-31 Tech. We got Mel in here, 42-35 Tech. We got Thomas Hughes, 31-28. We attempt to drive down the field for a field goal to go into overtime, just like Baylor. So I assume that Thomas thinks that they win this time. Um, on that front but let me get through a lot of these shout outs in terms of y'all's twitter if y'all haven't followed me on twitter already be sure to follow me at rcmb323 and hit that subscribe button right here on youtube 
over on Spotify as well. We're over there now. So we're going to be giving you weekly podcasts, maybe even two a week, especially when Chase pops on here. And by the way, if y'all missed that, we have Chase Champlin from RedRaiderSports.com. He will be joining us to talk about basketball all year long. It'll be a fun time. But let me run through some of these uh, shout outs that I got to get to in terms of the score predictions. I asked y'all to send me some over on Twitter. And let's start with Eli2814 Tech. We got the Mex Dad, Tech 31, State 27, Go Tech. Then we got Laughter is the Best Raider, 4138 Tech. We got Chad A saying Tech 37, State 34, Garibay ends it on a 47-yarder with no time left. We got Laura Walker, 4235 Tech. We got C. Sahila. 38-27 38-27 Tech. We got Drew Parker, 28-24 Tech. Thank our defense keeps us in it. Our offense does enough. We got Thomas Rodriguez, or Tomas Rodriguez, excuse me, Texas Tech, 31. Leach, 19. They missed two extra points is his prediction. We got Lefty, 25-25-1, 49-21 Mississippi State. We've got Lon. Uh, Larson, unfortunately, Mississippi State, 42, Texas Tech, 21. By the way, I'm just halfway through this now. Um, So we're getting there. We're getting there. We got a couple more. If you want a couple more drinks of water, by all means, Uh, we'll get back to it here. I'll stop on these after I get to the ones on this page. But we got Sydney Aaron, Mississippi State, 24, Texas Tech, 17. We got Duncan Stanley, 35, 34, Tech. Lead early, Mississippi State claws back, tries to put it away, and fails on a two-point conversion. I like that. I I like that one. Um, And then you got Jeff at Jefferson underscore 2435, Texas Tech 35, Mississippi State 24. And then I'll end on this one and come back later is stock pilot, pilot underscore stock on Twitter. And it's tech wins 3124. I have like 20 of these more to go. Like I can, you know, like when you're like scrolling, and like it takes a second to load this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of where I'm at right now. I have to go find stockpile again. There we go. Okay, cool. Your, I, oh, it's, it's all right. It's gonna yeah. be all right day. I did want to talk about this too when it came to the game because Tech's now in prime time. They're the only other game tonight um, in terms of just like big marquee bowl game. Um, and you think about it, you have an SEC school against the Big Twelve school. First of all, that's huge for Texas Tech, regardless win or lose. You're playing against an SEC product. When you look at what Texas Tech does well, um, how does that match up to Mississippi State? Not really in the terms of numbers or anything like that. We don't have to get too deep into the analytics. But what do you think Texas Tech, game by game, they do well that they have to continue that trend tonight against Mississippi State? Because when it comes down to it, I mean, you're a head ball coach, you know. If you don't do what you're good at, first and foremost, you have no chance at doing anything else right that game. Right. Like that's just how it is. You have to go in there with your basic principles, whatever that is from run blocking. If you don't run block, well, you're done. Mm -hmm. You're done in that game. So from a basic principle level, what do you think Texas Tech has to do well tonight that they obviously have done well all year? But now they have to do that to, you know, the top possible degree against an SEC school that, again, you don't match up well defensively against just like it or not. Um, but what do you think Texas Tech has to do well tonight to pull off this upset? And definitely, you know, I, we talked about it last podcast. I think the strongest unit on the defensive side, in my opinion, is is the secondary. And we know what Leach is going to give us. We know what Leach is going to do. Everybody in America knows what Leach is going to do. So the question is, are we able to contain them? And how do we contain them? We talked about last time, bringing pressure. Do we sit back in coverage? Do we play man coverage and bring blitz? Do we play zone and bring, uh, bring pressure? Whatever the case may be, we have to bring pressure, in my opinion, I think tonight uh, to be successful. And are those guys able um, to play in the moment? Because like I said, it's going to take a minute. Um, You talked about it and um, I'm a little different. You know, I don't disagree with you many times, but, uh, you know, it takes a minute for those guys to get acclimated. It takes a minute for those coaches to get acclimated. I think whoever can make the best adjustments is is what's going to make the difference in this game. Because like I said, we know what Leach is going to do. We know what Mesh is going to do. The question is, how can we stop it? What are our adjustments if we're not stopping the Mesh? Um, I think that's the difference in the game today. And 
like we talked about, do we pressure? Do we not pressure? I think that's the question that comes up. You know, when we get to drive four, drive five, have we adjusted enough to figure out how to stop the mesh? And if we haven't, it's going to be a long night. If we have, then we're going to be successful. So, like I said, playing those kids man on man, man on man, I don't think we um, have, you know, better athletes in that sense. But how can we help our athletes be the best that they can be during the game? And I think uh, that's what it's going to come down to because we know it. Uh, they know what we're going to do. We know what they're going to do. Bottom line, I think we run a lot more than Mississippi State, of course, but um, adjustments is what, what comes down to it when it gets to these ball games. Who can adjust better unless you have a dom dominant players? And I think, you know, for us, we don't have dominant players out of the two teams, so our adjustments are the key to the win. What do you think? What do you think about it? Well, I'm curious, like, how do you stop the mesh? You keep saying the mesh, and first and foremost, like, if you could, you know, Michael Scott, this for everybody that doesn't know, mm -hmm. what is mesh? Like what, in, in just the most basic terms, what is that? Because obviously Mike Leach has perfected it. He's gotten major college jobs in basically every conference at this point. You think about it, he's coaching the SEC, Pac-12, Big 12. I mean, you name it, he's probably coached there, right? So, and mesh has been the basic principle of all of this. But mm -hmm. what exactly is mesh for people that may not know? So for people that don't know, mesh is crossing routes, but the beauty of mesh is uh, it's able to be any type of coverage. So if it's cover zero, they have crossing routes that beat the man coverage um, and they, they cross really close. That makes uh, causes defenders to hit each other and allows people to get open. If it's zone, um, they have things that they add on. They have the crossing routes and they have a post behind it or they have outs behind it. You know, if you're a cover four, what that means for people at home is the cornerbacks are responsible for the deep half. I mean, not the deep half quarters. OK, so the cornerbacks are responsible for the quarters. Safeties are responsible for um, the four quarters between the cornerbacks and the safety. So um, within the mesh, they have an out route. So if you're backed up, they'll throw the out route. If you get to man, they'll bump and knock people out. If it's cover three, you're responsible for three, uh, um, three three uh, halves of the field. So you have the safety going down the middle, cornerback got the right half, another cornerback has the left half. So the mesh, the beauty of the mesh is it, within that play call, um, it beats any type of coverage. So the only thing that can stop that, in my opinion, is pressure. When you get pressure, it allows the quarterback to, to panic a little bit, and maybe make a wrong decision. But if not, if you sit back, um, whatever coverage you have, that mesh beats that. And I think that's been the, the greatness of that play. Um, I don't think people fully understand the greatness of that play. And, and for you offensive coordinators out there that want to run the mesh, understand you have to do that every single day. That's not something that you put in and, and it just rolls like that. You know, like we did that day in and day out. And so you guys don't want to do the mesh. You need to do that 24 seven. Um, and it's a great play. It's, it's pretty hard to stop. So I'm, I'm excited to see what our defense coach Patterson um, has for that. Um, because like I said, it's it's tough. Whatever coverage you call, the mesh can beat it. But like I said, the quarterback has to make that decision. I think that's been the key this year for Mississippi State. They have a really good quarterback, um, minus his name. Um, but he has a, you know, he's done great things this year. And and I think he's I think he's a freaking good quarterback. So obviously, you know, the mesh is designed to be any cover that you were talking about, man, zone, whatever you want, um, at whatever scheme, but what position unit you mentioned it in terms of pressure, but in terms of linebackers, corners, safeties, what position group probably has to be at its best tonight to limit the success of the mesh for the Red Raiders? Obviously, pressure is the number one, right? Like we know if you get pressure in a quarterback space in the system, you have a much higher chance to succeed. But let's just say they do it at an average amount tonight, Texas Tech. Who needs to perform at their peak tonight? Is that the DBs, the safeties, the linebackers? Uh, who, who needs to perform at their best tonight out of those three units? And see, that's the beauty of the mesh. There is no specific unit. Everybody has their own point uh, with the mesh because, like I said, uh, people play uh, coverages different ways. Um, you know, like sometimes the cornerbacks will switch with the safety. Sometimes the safety will switch. It depends on how you want to go about it covering the mesh. So I think – uh, for our defense, it's it's uh, key to how they go about the adjustments. Because, like I said, if you're asking a, a DB to cover our fastest or cover their fastest guy on mesh, he's got to run through people, you know, meshing each other and still. Just, if they're switching, you got to make that right switch because one 
one person switches and they don't pick it up, it's it's wide open, you know, as well as, you know, in the air raid offense, check down is the biggest thing. So you got the mesh going, you got posts behind it, you got corners behind it, and then you also have that check down. So if you sit back and say, well, I'm going to sit back, you know, they're taught to dump it to that check down. And like I said, that's, that's the biggest thing that people don't take advantage of. Because like I said, uh, I think the year uh, we were number number two in the nation, I think Shannon Woods had a thousand yards receiving. I think Baron Batch had a thousand yards receiving, uh, followed by like Danny and uh, Crab. So, I mean, it's it's a lot to it. It's just how do you go about it and how do you teach? It? It. I don't think there's a way to stop mesh if, you know, you have a good quarterback. But like I said, that's the key to air raid that people do not understand. That's the key to football. And like I said, if you go look at who's in the championship game, for instance, last year, who was in, in the NFL, who was in the championship game, um, Tom Brady, Brady Patrick game. Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes, two best quarterbacks in the NFL. Um, you go to college, um, who was in the championship last year? Uh, yeah, you got Alabama and everybody like that, man. Alabama Mac Jones. And there you go. He's like top four. You look at the top four quarterbacks. Them dudes are the best quarterbacks. In, in the college football. So I think that that's a key to it. And when it comes down to it, people don't understand that's the most important position. Um, and I think if we can rattle that man, then we'll, we'll have a chance. If we sit him and let him get comfortable back there, it's going to be a long night. So I'm excited well, to see what Coach Patterson has in store. I mean, everybody's running this too, right? I mean, at least a, a version of it, right? Like they might not be running the same exact system that you ran when you were at Texas Tech, the air raid that got the, you know, famous term and everything like that. But everybody has kind of had their own, I guess they repurposed it in a way to make right. it work best for their offense. Um, and when I hear mesh, like just from, a, you know, following the game and everything, it's like, oh, it's a natural pick play. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of. And if you can run a natural pick play, then run it as many times as you can. That's a, It basically creates a wide open guy, as you mentioned, because there's two guys that are stuck together on the defense because they get ran into each other. Um, but, but I think that's the thing, too, people got to realize. It's, it's not. Like, it sounds like that. That's easy, but it's not. Oh, it's no. No, no, no. no there's you know, no way. No, no, I'm not saying for yeah. you, but, like, when I've talked to other coaches, yeah. not you, you know, but other coaches I've talked to, they're like, yeah, man, I'll just do that. Or, well, like, you ha they have to know, like, your receivers have to run it at, you know, five yards. The other one has to be as close as he can. If they're not close to each other on the mesh, it defeats the purpose. You don't get that it's same, close. you know, and it's it's almost like a ball screen in basketball, right? Like yeah. when you run a pick and roll, like if there's too much space for the defender to get through, okay, it, the pick and roll just doesn't work. Like it's pointless. You, you literally just wasted a possession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you basically want like in the mesh system, just like you described, you basically want these guys. And I know this is a crazy way to look at it, but have you ever seen the video uh, of the Olympics where there's a blind guy running with a guy that can yeah, see and they're uh, running together. Yeah. That's the mesh. That's how much room you want separating them. Mm -hmm. Like, but obviously they're coming in different directions, right? You want literally no room possible there. You almost want elbows to elbows touching mm -hmm. kind of deal. Um, and you want to be doing that at full speed though. But another, <laughs> but another aspect to it that people don't realize is if it's zone, you're supposed to be that close and you're supposed to sit. So if there's a linebacker here and a linebacker yes. here, you've got to realize um, and how they were taught, how we were taught is, you know, you're looking at the other receiver coming across. If there's no one following that other receiver coming across from you, you know it's not man. Uh, if someone is not following, you know it's zone. But the question is, where do you sit? Because sometimes they got linebackers here. Sometimes they may have linebackers here. Sure. And have the picture. But – um, that's the thing I, I learned from Crab that, like I said, has really, really changed my game. My seniors understanding what they're doing. If you know it's covered three, and you know where that linebacker is going to be, you know where that hole is going to be. Um, so, I think that's the aspect that, you know, people don't don't fully understand. They just think it works. It doesn't always work. You know, your quarterback's got to know what he's doing. If it's ten yards off, you got to know you're throwing the out route. You know, um, and there's stuff as as an offense coordinator. If it's not the out route, you're tagging it in a post. All right, now what is that? What is what does a post do? It beats cover two. Yeah. So what does your quarterback read? So I just think it's a lot to it. You know, how are you teaching? Are you teaching the out to the post to the mesh? And like I said, for a quarterback uh, too, like I said, you 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 drop back. People are getting in the backfield. You know, you got six four dudes, two ninety coming at you. You got guys 
you as a quarterback have to decipher, is it man, is it zone? Do I take that first read? Is he sitting? Is he running? So that's the part two people don't understand too. It, you got to be on the same page with your quarterback because, you know, you can have receivers say, well, I thought it was man. Quarterback say, well, I thought it was zone. Thinking will get you beat. So yeah. it's a lot to that, and you know that, but it's a lot to it. I think offensive coaches don't realize, and they try to do it, and then they're not successful in it because they don't fully understand it. You know, you've got to be on the same page. Everybody has got to be on the same page and say, okay, this is zone. This is where I'm sitting. Quarterback's got to say, okay, this is zone. This is where you need to sit. And it's a lot. If you're not practicing 20, college gets 24 seven to practice it. You know, like when we play in these bowl games, uh, coach Leach, we played in the cotton bowl, which is January, whatever it was, January 4th. And we had to be back at school probably January 15th. So out of the whole year, we got 10 days off. And so we did mesh for 300 and whatever it is. 55 days a year. 55 days. And so these high school guys, you don't get your kids like that. They have school. They have summer you have to get off. And it's and so when you see it, and the, you know, it looks like poetry in motion, you got to realize how much time was spent doing that. You know, there's not really – there is rules and regulations, but like I said, in the morning we watch film. You know, we go to summer school, we come out, do seven on seven, we meet with yeah. you don't get that at, at that at the at many levels. So I think, I think that's oh, go ahead. Thing. Yeah, no, no, no I, I think that the best part about like you describing this is that yeah, we're talking about this from a leech perspective, obviously. But who's the new offensive coordinator for Texas Tech? Is that Kitley? What is he gonna run a lot next year? You can bet it's gonna be mesh. Mm -hmm. that's what he runs he runs the air raid so getting that you know just really what it is and what you can expect and everything for the people watching I think that that's perfect because they can go into next year expecting okay well I can go back to this podcast right now and by the way if you haven't subscribed do that um, but you can go back to this and hear you explain it in the sense of okay well he, we're talking about this from a Mike Leach perspective but don't get this twisted this is exactly what Kitley is going to do next year for mm -hmm. Texas Tech. And now there might be a little bit of different variations from it, but where did Kitley learn how to do this? Texas Tech from Cliff Kingsbury. Who did Cliff Kingsbury run, learn how to run an offense from? Mike Leach. Michael Leach. There you go. So it, it comes back down to who do you learn it from? And you can always, you know, spice it up, do a little bit things differently. But when it comes down to it, the air rate at its base principle is ran the exact same at every level, but because you have to do these, you have to do certain things right to run the air raid, as you mentioned. And so Zach Kittley's going to do that at Texas Tech. But now we're going to get to almost see like a sneak peek of what this Texas Tech offense could look like next year from Mike Leach. But maybe Texas Tech uses tight ends a little bit more. Maybe there's running backs more involved because Kittley did mention that that's what he wanted to do. But at the same time, the basic principles of everything you are going to see for the next three years with the contract that Zach Kittley has you were going to see tonight from Mike Leach. That's just the truth. No, absolutely. And I just, um, like I said, I hope people understand too what comes with that. Um, I know he's going to do a great job, but understand, you know, there's times where we lost 65 to 60 and people are like, defense sucks. Well, understand, like, we're going to score a lot of points, but there's a lot of three and outs. There's a lot of interceptions. There's a lot of yep. turnovers. That's just a part of that offense. So understand um, what we're asking our defense to do when we run this type of offense. And like I said, he's done a great job. But if you go look at, you know, Western Kentucky, the games that they lost, they lost because they gave up a lot of points, but they got a lot of possessions on offense. So I think we, as fans, have to understand what comes with that. We want the Mike Leach stuff. We love it, this, that, and the other, and it's great. But understand, we, you, we're running a lot of plays, and if we're not productive, the defense is going to be out there a lot. So – understand what comes with that, what the people are asking for. And I just hope that they they get that and understand, hey, we're asking for it, but this is what comes with that as well. So like I said, I've seen defensive guys that we've had be on the field 80% of the time and be dead tired out there on, you know, we're asking to make a stop to win the game and they're dead tired. They've been out there a hundred plays. And so that's just what comes with it. So we got to ride with it. Yeah, absolutely. If y'all haven't already, be sure to hit that like button, share it on Twitter. I just retweeted it um, in terms of the link. Get more people in here as we inch closer to kickoff about an hour away from the last game of 2021 for Texas Tech before Joey McGuire era 
officially begins for the Red Raiders. I know that, uh, you know, it, it's technically started already, but let's be honest, he's still an interim tag with Sonny Cumbie. Keith Patterson is obviously the D.C. still. The Joey McGuire era starts tonight officially when that clock hits triple zero. That's just the fact that of it. Uh, but I want to give a couple more shout outs real quick. We got Tyson over on Twitter. Um, this was this one actually made me laugh a little bit. Most recent former tech coach, 33. Least recent former tech coach, 26. <laughs> wow. That one made me laugh a little bit. Uh, then we got Cameron just because of the whole less recent, most recent type deal. Because you're right. You, you mentioned it earlier. Technically, Sonny Cumbie. Yes, he's still the interim coach right now at Texas Tech, but he's technically Louisiana Tech's head coach right now, too. So there's that. Um, you got Cameron on here saying 42-33 Bulldogs. You got Andrew McCleary, who does great stuff over at Guns Up Nation, 52-49. Then you got Adam Joseph. If Easy was playing, I think Tech would have a shot. Don't blame him for not doing so. Mississippi State, 38, Tech, 21. Then Alex says, RC, I want to know your prediction. And then his – he says mine is Texas Tech 42 34, and that's from Alex. That's not my prediction. We'll get to that a little later. Um, then Chris says 27 18 Texas Tech. And then we got McGuire is my soulmate. Is McGuire your soulmate? Mm, no. Be a no for me, bro. That'd be a no. Okay. My wife no judgment. Me, wouldn't allow me to say that. Okay. No judgment. I was just, just curious more than anything. It's a question. He asked the question. I, I just figured I'd ask. Shout you out know. to my wife. Can't do it. There we go. Yeah. No, absolutely. I get it. Um, realistically, 35, 24, Mississippi state, hopeful 31, 28, Texas tech. It's fair. Yeah. We got, uh, Mr. Garcia over here, Texas tech 45, Mississippi state 44. Then we got Felipe 34, 20, Mississippi state. And then the last one for right now is the Schneider brothers ballers tech 21, Mississippi state 14. Schneider, Texas. Schneider brother ballers. No, it's not spelled the same way. Okay. No. They beat us pretty good this year. I, 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 I would have to take their shout out back. They beat no. Us pretty bad this year. Okay. No, these, these, uh, this is a, a guy from uh, Colorado. So there okay. you go. Okay. Bless no. Like realistically, though, like thinking about it and looking at what the over under is, you'd be shocked if the over doesn't hit, right? And it's at 58 points right now. You'd be shocked, right? Absolutely. Like, I'm trying to think of a way where it doesn't hit. And I realistically can't think of one. If people in here uh, want to guess, like, over, under, again, it's 58 points. Let us know in the chat. Over, under, 58 points. I, I, I legitimately don't see a way where it's not over 58. Yeah, absolutely. Unless it's just like a random monsoon yeah. happens in Memphis. Right? Yeah. Like, I don't see a way, like, uh, especially with Mike Leach, Sonny Cumbie, and we haven't talked about this in the sense that we talked about that Sonny Cumbie has nothing to hide or anything, but I also think Sonny Cumbie has something to prove in the sense where, listen, he wants to prove that, like, hey, I can coach up against the best of the best when it comes to SEC talent, right? I want to prove that La Tech made the right decision. I want to prove that this wasn't a fluke, me getting this job. I want to prove that I'm an elite play caller. I want to prove this, this, and this, right? Like he has a lot to prove tonight. And I think the biggest thing he has to prove tonight is I want to prove that I can beat Mike Leach, the guy that told me this. It's like, you know, that Obi-Wan type deal with, you know, Anakin Skywalker, right? Like he wants to prove that he can beat the guy that's supposed to be, you know, the smarter dude in, to be fair, I know that Sonny Cumbie would say that Mike Leach is smarter than him when it comes to this offense, and rightfully so. That's fair. But also at the same time, that doesn't mean that the, you know, Anakin doesn't win sometimes, like right. in those wars and those battles. So I think that that's what Sonny Cumbie wants to do tonight is go out there first and foremost, prove that, hey, La Tech, the Bulldogs, they made the right decision. Second of all, he wants to prove that he is an elite play caller and that, we already know he's a great leader of men. I mean, we've already seen that, right? Like that, that's just a fact, hmm. but I think he wants to come out there tonight and prove that, Hey, like this wasn't a fluke. I'm going to go out there and prove that I'm an elite play caller on a nationwide, you know, platform, right? You're on ESPN tonight. You're not on, you know, 
ESPN plus or whatever the hell that is big 12 now or whatever, right? Like you are on the scale of the scale. You are going to be the only football game on at this time um, around the country. So I think that that's a point that probably hasn't been talked about enough when it comes to this game is what does Sonny Cumbie do leading up to this or during this game in terms of, we already mentioned it. He's going to go out and he's just going to throw everything he has at, you know, the kitchen sink and whatnot, but also at the same time, there's a pride in showing everybody who he is factor that probably doesn't get us like discussed enough by us or really anybody that's covering the game. Right. Right. And that's the thing I talked about earlier is just, you know, that's the difference, you know, Sonny is going to prove something. Patterson is going to prove something like Leach is the godfather. Like he is like him and how are the godfather. Everybody knows that he's going to do what he does. And I think that's the advantage for tech. Um, the difference is like, you know, for Leach, you know, of course he wants to win. This is big for him. But at the same time, he's established. At the end of the day, if Mississippi State loses to Tech, there's no one that's going to say Mike Leach isn't a good coach. Not one person. Uh, now, if Cumbie doesn't win, somebody might say, oh, well, he's not ready to be a head coach. Exactly. Patterson might not be ready. To coach. So it's more for them than it is for Leach. Leach's deal is he wants to beat Tech because they owe him money. But, you know, if we thought about it is if Tech paid him whatever he was owed, would he still have that same vengeance? Would he still feel the same way he felt? Or is it because he didn't get his money? So I think that's the question like we're asking here. Like Leach is, you know, because he did he felt like he didn't get his money. That's where his vengeance is coming from versus Cumbie and Patterson are like, hey, this is my last game. I got a chance to say, hey, I beat the Godfather. And, you know, it's exactly. like. Exactly. It's the reason, like, I mean. Again, like it's one of those deals where I get it. Um, you know, you've already talked about it. Mike Leach is already established and everything like that. But think about the momentum that that could not only pick up for Texas Tech beating Mike Leach and just shutting this whole, whole narrative up about, you know, the pirate and whatnot. Like I get it. He's, he's a very important part of Texas Tech's history and everything. But also it's kind of a black eye with everything that happened in the way that he left, right? Like – it sucks. It sucks, but that's the reality of it. But at the same time, if you beat him tonight and then you go and Sonny Cumbie leaves too and has success at La Tech, this could be a monumental stepping stone for Texas Tech moving forward. And you've already seen what Joey McGuire's done on the recruiting trail without this momentum. Imagine what he could do if he did win this game. And that's, what, and that's, and that's my point, you know. Uh, if Leach wins, he's supposed to win. If Leach loses, they're like, dang, Leach got beat. So – it's a lose-lose for him in a sense. And for Tech, uh, it's a win-win situation. If Tech wins, like, oh, man, we beat Mike Leach. If Tech loses, like, we weren't supposed to win. We got a new coach. We got people out. So I think just the whole narrative of both sides is different. Like, it's not as big of a deal. It is, like, for Texas Tech to win tonight is huge for fans, for players. They feel like, you know, I think if Texas Tech wins tonight, that's the relief we need to say, man, we don't need Leach. Like, we do. But if Leach wins tonight, like, this, I feel like everyone's going to be like, man, we need him. And then it's going to carry on what we need. So I think this is like a relief game. And I think that the players know that. I think that the coaches know that. This is a relief game to say, okay, we beat Leach. We're good. We don't need him anymore. And I think it's just so much more for Tech than it is for Mississippi State. And I think – that's the advantage for Tech. Because like I said, to Mississippi State, I don't care what no one says, besides Leach, everyone else is just a game. And they expect to win. They Yeah, there's they, no they history. There's team. no history there. Yeah. So for Texas Tech, is the only people that's taking that in there. Like, I guarantee you, like, Leach is going to sleep tonight. Or, I mean, last night he went to sleep with not a worry about, oh, man, I got to beat Texas Tech. Like, no, he's going to do what he's Oh, absolutely not. And that's it. But for the Red Raider Nation, like, this is, like, this is everybody's heart on the line. Like, hey, we need this to kind of let go. So, I think it's just the scenarios is totally different of what we're playing for and what we're trying to do. And so, I think that's the part that, you know, the the part that is the advantage for Texas Tech. In every aspect of Texas Tech, it's bigger for us than it is for my bottom line coaches. Yeah, it, it's, it's so interesting. Like, just the storylines – that this game presents. And obviously Mike Leach is the biggest one. Um, but like, I mean, I could be wrong just because it's so rare. 
Um, I think I'm probably right on this and somebody check me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'm pretty sure this is the only bowl game with three division one head coaches in it. Mm. Like you think about it, Mike Leach is there, got Sonny Cumbie, and then you got Keith Patterson. And not to mention you got Darshell McBath, you got former Texas Tech dudes on there. Uh, yeah. You got uh, – uh, yeah, yeah I saw the – I want to give him a shout-out. Chris Lovell, he sent out a picture of that um, and everything like that where they – uh, like, I, I believe it was uh, – oh, my goodness, who was it? It was McBath and – oh, my goodness, I forgot who he was with. Dave I, I want to say it was John Harris, right? John Harris? It was on Beale Street um, and everything like that. I don't even know who John Harris is. Who's John Harris? Oh, we, oh we call, maybe I got the name wrong, but he calls games for Texas Tech and everything. Radio. No, no, you could be right. I don't know. But I yeah. do know level. And like I said, I talked to uh, McBath quite a bit. Like I said, super dude. Shout out to him. Best safety I've ever played against. Um, but Dave Emery, like I said, great dude. Coach Leach, great dude. Um, they have a bunch of Texas Tech people that are great dudes. So, like I said, I, I don't even think people have dug deep to see even the roots of it. Because there's a lot of people on his staff that um, have super ties and – like I said, I know um, Coach McBath. Like I said, I know how great of a coach he is. I know what he's about, but I also know that Texas Tech, he came to Texas Tech, got drafted in the second round. So I know he has love for Texas Tech um, too. So it, it's interesting. Like I said, it's an intertwined uh, game of, of Texas Tech, Mississippi State. And so, like I said, I, I could tell people from when I was at West Virginia, like, of course, I wanted us to win when I was at West Virginia, but at the same time, like, I believe you ready to lack. So, um, it's going to be interesting to see and, and the emotions, you know, who, who's holding their emotions together. How, how, you know, is Mississippi State going out there like, oh, we got to win? Is Texas Tech going out there like, we got to win? Who can hold their emotions in the game of football? You got your highs and your lows. Who's able to um, combat that and who's able to, you know, react, react and being able to make plays is the name of the game. We all know that. And like I said, I've seen some bowl games. I, even today, I think Auburn let their emotions get the best of them. Um, and I think that's why they lost. But um, like I said, it's easy for us to sit back and say when you're not in that moment, when you're not playing out there. And like I said, I, I've been in them situations where I'm like, man, it's not a big deal. And then you get out there, you get ramped up to the to the maximum. You, you try to do stuff that you normally wouldn't do. Um, so I think it's a lot to it. And I'm excited to see these um, young men perform and, and see these coaches. Uh, like I said, I think there's great coaches on both sides. And I think I said it's it's more even than people think. But at the end of the day, I think it's adjustments is going to be who's going to win the game. And like I said, only Tom could tell. Yeah, I think that that's probably the most interesting aspect of it um, when it all comes down to it. We've obviously talked about the Mike Leach storyline um, at nauseum at this point. But I, I mean, Texas Tech has talent on this team, right? Like you think about the transfers they brought in here. We're talking about power five transfers. We're talking about guys from UCLA. We're talking about guys from Arizona. We're talking about Pac-12 talent. We're talking about ACC talent. We're talking about a ton of talented guys, right? Like this defense is old. And I think if this is going to be the time that Texas Tech goes out and proves that narrative wrong, like in the sense of, let's be honest about it, the stats don't lie to some degree. Texas Tech defense hasn't been great in the secondary. It just hasn't, right? But if you take away two games when it comes to the rushing aspect of things, Texas Tech has been absolutely elite, just simple and plain. They have been absolutely elite, and there's no way around that. Um, they've been top 10 in the country stopping the run. The problem is Mississippi State ain't running the football tonight. I can promise you that. You know that, too, because y'all didn't run the football much when Mike Leach was there. Um, so you know that as well. So I, I think when it comes down to it for me, this secondary is going to have to play lights out. I mean, just lights out tonight. And I know that you mentioned that, and we talked about this on a previous podcast as well, that pressure's the name of the game, right? Like, it's the name of the game. That's If you do not get pressure on the quarterback, you are going to have a long day if you are the Red Raiders. And that's just simple and plain. There's no way about it. There's no way to go around it. Um, but talk to me about this on offense, Donovan Smith, 
we haven't really talked about the tech offense that much um, in this sense. You think about the Mississippi State defense, they're all right. They're, you know, mid-60s in the country and everything like that. What do you think Sonny Cumbie goes to to get Donovan Smith in rhythm? Because you think about it, there's not very many guys on this Texas Tech roster right now, Lyle, that have actually played in a bowl game. I mean, Texas Tech hasn't played in a bowl game since 2017, right? Rico Jeffers is one of the only starters on defense that has played in a bowl game, and he was a freshman. Like, he was playing next to a what was going to be a first-round NFL draft choice and Jordan Brooks, right? So what do you have to do if you're off – the offense, because this is going to be an offensive game. We both agreed with that and everything like that. What does Sonny Cumbie and Donovan Smith have to do well early to make sure this doesn't just become you know, one of those games where you're always behind and you may be behind by, you know, three or seven points. That's all right. But I'm talking more like two possessions. Like what do you have to do early if you're Texas tech and what do you have to do at a high level to make sure you're in this game till the very end? I think definitely just stick to your game plan. I think, you know, this ain't the time to switch it up and do the most. Uh, I think these are the times to get creative within what you do. And I don't think people understand um, when it comes to offense, you can be creative within what you do. Now, if you're making up something totally different, your quarterback's got to learn that. But you can be creative in what you do. I think execution is the name of the game. We both do the same thing on both sides. You know, we're both going to run the stick route. We're both looking at that, you know, talking to my football coaches here. We're both looking at that apex backer. Does he go to the running back? Does he sit on the stick route? However we do that, you've got to execute and be able to execute that. Um, so it's super simple, the game plan, but I think it comes down to who executes better. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily who can make it easier. I think it's, you know, who can execute bottom line. There's no easier. Mike Leach is going to run mesh. We're going to run mesh. Mike Leach is going to run stick. We're going to run stick. Uh, vice versa. We run the same concepts. But the, uh, I think the, the question is, is how can we uh, keep Donovan um, you know, feeling comfortable, the old line, how can we run our offense, what we do, um, and allow him to get the ball out of his hands quickly so we're not asking the old line to block for five minutes. Um, like I said, they're, I think we're going to have struggles with the old line. We both agree our old line is, um, needs improvement a little bit. And, and not the strong the suit. Is, yeah, <laughs> I think the question is how can we get the ball out of his hands quickly, but how can we make him feel comfortable? And I think it comes down to all units. Uh, we're going to have to make stops on defense and we're going to we're going to have to make plays on offense. So um, I think it's a little bit of both. I just think it's how we I think for for me, how Coach Cumbie can make him feel comfortable and don't um, I think if we're making him feel like we got to win, we got to beat Leach. It's going to be a long night if he's like, hey, I'm going out there to execute our offense, what we've done the entire year. Um, I think we'll have some success, but I think as fans, we got to understand uh, it may take a drive or two. Um, this is a defense that we're not accustomed to seeing. This is a style of defense we're not accustomed to seeing uh, in the Big 12. So it's going to be a little different for us. It's going to be a curve. It's going to take them a few drives, I think, to, to get acclimated. But it comes down to how can we adjust once we understand what they're trying to do to us on defense. Because as I said, as a bowl game, we got to understand they've had a lot of time to prepare for us as an offense and understand what we're trying to do. So how can we, once we figure out what they're trying to do, how can we adjust and move forward our offense? I think that's the key. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't know who this is in the chat, but Dur Wake, man, coach, do you know what my favorite play call is in all of football? Draw. No, I hate draws, to be honest with you. I can't stand a draw. RPOs. Give me all of the RPOs. Like, every RPO you run, I think you just get a step closer to just, like, wherever you want to be in life. I love a good RPO. Um, and this is what Derwake said in the chat right here. I hope we use the quarterback run and normal run a ton, then blast them over the top. I don't hate that strategy. Um, in the sense, but here's the thing I've noticed about Donovan Smith, and you'd obviously know a little bit better on this RPO side of things. In the games that we've seen him at the quarterback position, he seems hesitant to keep it sometimes. Like he seems like he doesn't want to keep the ball in his hands too much, and that he wants to kind of please everybody, if that makes sense. And that's fine. I get it. He's a young guy. 
But Donovan Smith, in terms of the athletes that you have on the offensive side of the football tonight, is the best asset you have. Simple and plain. You have to use him in so many different facets tonight. I think the RPOs are going to be critical because we talked about it earlier. And again, if you didn't listen to the first podcast here on the Back to 12 podcast, well, you would have known a week and a half in advance because Lyle was over here dropping bombs about Eric Isakama going to the NFL draft. He won't be playing tonight. So who steps up in his place? First of all, I don't think anybody can step up and be an Eric Isakama. And that's okay. I don't expect anybody to be yourself, right? But I do think that that means that Donovan Smith needs to keep the ball more on these RPOs. He needs to use his physicality because even in the SEC, right, like we're talking about a guy in Donovan Smith that is 6'5", 230, and he runs a 4'49". They don't have those in the SEC either at the quarterback position. You need to use him at on the RPOs. You need to keep the ball away from Mike Leach. And I think that's what Derwake is saying here. If you can limit those possessions, right? Mississippi State's going to have big plays. That's going to happen. It's part of the offense. But if you can limit the time that they're on the field and you can have sustainable drives if you're Texas Tech and just make it to where your defense can rest. You mentioned that earlier. You talked about it where you had those three and outs when you were playing at Tech and your defense was just gassed because you were having three and outs. If you can limit that tonight, if you're Texas Tech, I think you keep yourself in the game longer. The problem is you can't have these long drives and settle for field goals every time. Jonathan Garibay is awesome, but you have to get seven. You have to. That's what it's going to be because Mississippi State is going to get seven on you frequently tonight. At least that's what the odds and the numbers say. Um, So, yeah, I think that that's a really good point that Durwake brings up. Use the quarterback run, normal run a ton. I think Taj Brooks – is a guy that I am going to be watching a lot tonight because at the running back position, this is where you can kind of control the pace of the game, right? You can take that out of Mike Leach's hands to a degree where you know they're going to go fast, but if you can keep the fast offense off the field, more power to you. Absolutely, man. I I think, too, uh, to put it in layman terms uh, for RPOs, what people got to understand is, is if two cars are coming directly towards each other, um, do you turn right or left and yep. you want to avoid the accident? So as a driver, if you're going head on with somebody, are you turning right or left? How do you know? And that's what it comes down to when an RPO, yep. are you turning right or left? It's that quick and it's that hard to make that decision. So people say RPOs, throw RPOs around and I love RPOs. But at the same time, if you're a driver and we're telling you to avoid an accident, if someone's coming head on with you, do you turn right or left? At the You don't have a test there. You know, you don't have a Tesla. What's up with that? Oh, definitely not. That's outside my funds. I have a Tesla. So, you know. Oh, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. No it's easier to avoid those collisions I hear with Teslas or, or maybe they happen more frequently. I don't know. I don't have one. We have a Nissan. So there you go. Hey, I'm a Nissan fam. Shout out to you. Shout out respect. to Nissan if y'all want to sponsor. Yeah, uh, respect. You know, but I think people, you know, in all honesty, got to realize it's that quick. Um, yeah. And there's many times where you're driving, you're asking a you know, a 19 year old kid um, and not to mention there's stuff that's involved with that alignment misses a block. So not only now are you making that, you know, head on decision, there's somebody in the driver's seat poking you and I, that's basically what it comes down to. And if you think of it like that, that's, that's pretty tough. Um, You know, me as a coach, I I love RPOs, but at the same time, it's very hard. So when you're asking a quarterback, you know, you kind of mentioned that he's hesitant. He's hesitant because it's hard to make that decision at a split second. And another thing we got to realize is some of these guys are super fast. So you got six, four, 250 (laughs) linebackers that run four twos, four threes, you know. So not only, you know, you're adding obstacles on going head on driving. That's basically like driving, being blindfolded because those guys are able to play the run and play the pass at the same time because they're just athletic athletic dudes, you know so I think when we talk about RPOs and and people talk about RPOs you got to understand how quick that is and I guarantee if we got a hundred people and said hey make this decision this is how RPOs go I guarantee you 95 or 95 people will fail and that's how hard it is so like I said you're either blessed to be able to read RPOs there's very few people that are able to do that um, and people don't understand, like Patty Mahomes, like in the NFL, you got Patty Mahomes, Tom Brady, uh, 
I mean, other than that, I mean, I watched Carson Wentz play the night and struggle with RPOs. This is an NFL dude that that's all he does for a living. Uh, so yeah. I don't think there's many guys that understand that. So when people say RPOs, understand you're asking a guy to make a split decision. And if a lineman misses a block, you got a lineman, a 6'4", 290-pound yeah. dude coming full speed and making that decision. So it, it's a it's a lot. RPOs, you got to be um, special players to, to be able to do that on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean, come on, the Lyle. I mean, I excel at it on rookie mode in Madden. Why can't these guys do it in real life? Right. True you know what I'm saying? Like, come on now, man. It shouldn't be that difficult. Just kidding. Just kidding, obviously. Um, this from Derwake to RC. Over, under, one muff punt or kickoff catch tonight. Oh. You know what? I'm going to go with uh, – I think special teams plays well tonight. I do. I do. I think that they play really well tonight. Um, now, there might be a bobble or two. I think that that's to be expected in a new stadium and a new climate that you typically don't play in. Um, but I also think that – Special teams has drastically changed the whole narrative around the special teams unit. Two years ago, three years ago, you didn't even have a kicker on the roster that you trusted. Now you have arguably the best one in college football. Mm. You also have a punter that literally has the longest punt in Texas Tech history on your roster. And again, mm. one of the best in college football. And your special teams unit has struggled a little bit this year in terms of just making sure you catch the ball and everything. But I do expect um, Geiger to be a really integral part of the offense tonight. Um, I don't think you see Adrian Fry much back there. Um, but I also wonder at the same time where how many young guys do we see tonight in terms of that we didn't expect to see? Like, you know, just looking at some of these guys that haven't played a lot this year that I'm kind of excited about in the future. Do we see a lot of J.J. Sparkman? Do we see a lot of Trey Cleveland at the wide receiver position? How much, you know, Jed Castles do we see tonight at the tight end spot? I love – I don't know um, how much you keep up with recruiting. I know you have a ton going on in your life. I know it's difficult to follow recruiting. But my favorite recruit last year, and this includes Baron Morton in there, that four-star quarterback, the sixth highest-ranked recruit ever in Texas Tech history. My favorite recruit in that entire class was Mason Tharp, the tight end. I want to see – how he is used. And I wonder if tonight we see some of these guys that we've been asking about all year. Why is he not being more you like, why is he not involved as much? Why is he not being used as much? Well, now with Eric is a a guy that is an all big 12 type player. Some of these guys are going to have to step up simple and plain. That's just how this is going to work. Like if you want to win this football game, you're going to have to have guys like a Kalen Geiger step up a miles price step up. You're going to have Travis Koontz in his final college game have to step up, so on and so forth down the line, right? So for me, special teams is the thing I'm not even worried about tonight. I'm more worried about who's that primary pass catcher for you tonight because you, 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 you don't have Eric Zakama. And now if you're Donovan Smith in the biggest game of your college career so far, who becomes your security blanket, you know, in a way? Who, who is that guy that, like, if you're in a rough situation – even maybe if it's a two on one or it's a tight window, who do you feel comfortable throwing to? Because, you know, that guy can, you know, make it a better chance for you to get the catch that ball or make something happen for you. I don't, I don't know who that is. That That's the thing that kind of scares me tonight. If I had to guess, I would guess it's Kalen Geiger. But we're also talking about a guy that's shorter than me. Mm -hmm. I think you got to stick to what you're doing, though. Bottom line, whoever that is, you got to stick to what you're doing. You can't change your game plan up. Uh, because somebody's out, you know, everybody's got to step up, but it's got to be within our game plan, what we're trying to do. And I think Cumbie will keep it with that. Like I said, I think we'll have a couple of trick plays, but for the most part, we're going to do what we've done all season. Um, that's why we're in a bowl game. And so I think somebody else is going to have to step up, but the thing in the air raid, you know, you can pinpoint who you want to get the ball to, but everybody's got to make plays. And I think we're going to stick to what we're doing. All right, let me get through the rest of these shout outs real quick and then we'll get down to our game predictions. Yes, sir. And everything like that. We've been live for an hour and 20 minutes now. Hey, we'll let everybody get a little bit of food before this game starts. Get that pizza order in. You a, you a big wing guy? Yeah, love wings. Love wings. Okay. Lemon pepper, original hot for sure. What about you? You a flats or drumstick guy? Um, both. I don't well, I, I, I think we've had this, but gun to your head. You got to pick. Which one are you going with? Uh, I'd go with flats. Okay, good, good, good. We're on the same page. I didn't have to. I didn't, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about, about to turn flavor. off the podcast and never talk to you again if you said drumsticks. Um, um, well, not, not to be like over dramatic or anything. Not to be over dramatic. Um, you know, I not to be flavors. over. I need flavors from you, RC. Oh, well. Whew. Top two. Really anything at Pluckers slaps. Um, let's just go with that. Um, big mango habanero guy. Yeah. Big mango habanero guy. Um, I forget what it's called at Pluckers, but my buddy Mike put me onto it. We went to go watch the Gonzaga game there a couple weeks ago. Shout and um, yeah, it's it. I don't know exactly what how to describe it, but it's like almost like a honey. It's like a smoky honey almost mm-hmm. in a way. And um, I'm not saying that I would do dramatic things to get a lifetime supply of them, but I would. I would. Yeah. I would. I would absolutely. Um, all right. Oh, by the way, here's Dur Wake right here. Shout out to Dur Wake. He's been in the comment Shout section over there. here, and he's been over here on Twitter too. Shout out to him. Um, Texas Tech 35, Mississippi State 28. We got Hakeem 38, 30, Texas Tech. Chief hey. Red Raider 31, 28, Texas Tech. We got Mike, Mike 806, 35, 24, Texas Tech with a laughing emoji. Hey, sometimes you just got to rep it, Mike. Then you got Stacy coming in, 35, 31, Texas Tech, 60, 60, 59, Tech. That from Danny Slamandola. By the way, that's probably the best name in the comments right now so far. Then we got 31, 24, State. That from Ground Box. Then we got Brandon, 35, 31, Tech. And then... We've got a couple more down here. We got Howdy, and he says, wow, he almost predicted the basketball game. Exactly right. Good for him. He predicted the basketball game 30 or 72-54, and then he said Texas Tech beats Mississippi State 33-26. And while Lyle is away, if y'all haven't already, be sure to like the video, share the video, hit that big red button, and subscribe. Turn the notifications on as well. If you don't mind. Oh, hello. How are you? Oh, walking away. Trying to say hi to people. It's all right. But if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, like the video and everything like that. Once Lyle comes back, we will hop in and we will give our favorites in terms of like what we're watching tonight, who we think does well. I'll give you a hint. I think a certain number seven does well tonight. And then I will give my score prediction. A lot of people have been asking me for it on Twitter. Um, but, man, I'm, I'm just so excited that we're back in a bowl game, everybody. I really am, just for the sheer fact of there's excitement around this program, something that we haven't had in such a long time. There's Lyle. All right, let's wrap it up here, man. We've been talking forever. I want to go get some food before this. I got extra Chipotle in the refrigerator. You, I'm super excited. Eat? Chipotle for tonight's game. Chipotle, we got extra. Oh, nice. Yeah. Chipotle's the best, my wife's favorite. Shout out to Chipotle. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. What, do you, what What's your go-to at Chipotle real quick before we get into the predictions? For sure, bowl. You know, I get the double rice, half white, half brown, half okay. black, half, uh, you know, pinto, half okay. chicken, half beef, uh, you know, corn, a little bit of everything like that. Wait, did you say bowl. corn? Yeah, absolutely. I can't get corn, man. Why? I hate corn. But that's 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 roasted. That's a different. Thing. No, I know, but I hate corn. Now, have you ever tried Chipotle's corn though? Yeah, yeah, I hate corn. Oh, okay, respect, respect. What what's your go to? I'm with you there. You got to go with the bowl. Trick okay. though, trick. Get a tortilla on the side. Okay. Get a tortilla on the side. I'll go with brown rice, black okay. beans, chicken. Mm. Then you go with the pico. Oh, and by the way, I forgot. Put veggies on there for me too. Right. Absolutely. Got to get the veggies. What get kind the of pico, sauce? A little bit of the hot sauce. A little bit because Green listen. Or red? The red one. Okay. And I say a little bit and I mean it. Just give me a little bit because I will be sitting on a certain place in my house mm. for a while if I get a little bit too much, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no one deserves that. Yeah, I don't want that. Yeah. Um, and then I'll go with the cheese and the lettuce. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Straight no to sour it. cream? No queso? Not a sour cream guy. No, I don't hate I, I don't hate sour cream. Sour cream's all right, but corn I have a vendetta against. Queso? Yeah, I just don't want to spend extra money. Okay. Respect. Yeah, I would get the guac if it wasn't extra. Respect. Yeah, it just really comes down to the financials of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. If if I got a gift card, why the hell not? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's I just kind of my philosophy. I know what to get you for your birthday and uh next Christmas, brother. 
Yeah, no, yeah, it definitely. And Carson mentions this and Dura Wake, stop it. Get that corn emoji out of the chat right now. That's disgusting. Um, but Carson brings this up. Carson Freeman, tortilla on the side is fuego. It's fuego, man. Have, have you ever gotten the tortilla on the side? No, I never have. But I have gotten a burrito, so I can only imagine the goodness that uh, that comes with that, you know. I feel like we're obligated to get a tortilla any chance we get just because we went to Texas Tech, you know. Obviously, we don't want to put a hole in a certain place and hold it where most of the people do going into the game. Um, but that's a different story. You never had to do that as a student. Do you know where they put the tortillas? No, I don't. But, at, you know, at Texas Tech, if you're listening right now, I have two dreams. Uh, it'd, it'd be to throw a tortilla on the field. Uh, secondly, it'd be to be the mass rider. Just let me ride out one game with my jersey on. You're riding the horse? Yeah, I throw off my mask, throw the guns up. Uh, text tag if y'all listen let your boy do that that's all that's all I ask I'm a simple man I feel like it would be lit like hear me out on this I feel like it would be just all kinds of lit yeah if there was a way I don't know how you could make it West Texas so somebody help me out um, but like make it to where you bring alumni like yourself with mm-hmm. the mass rider so you don't have to ride the horse per se but maybe the mass rider is pulling something and you're just on there getting the crowd hyped up. Yeah, that'd be tight. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know how that works, um, but I feel like there's something there. You're on to something. That, I that's feel like I, I don't know what it is, though. Like, I'm not that guy. Because you can't be like the – you can't do it like USC. You know what I mean? Because they're just like, oh, you're copying, the, you know, the whole Trojan horse thing where they have, like, the sidecar and everything. Yeah. Like, you can't do that. I get or it. The OU where you're pulling the – Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, there's got to be, like, a West Texas way to do that. Yeah. Or, you know, it'd be cool. Like, for example, since this is off and running, you know how they bring like a famous celebrity out of USC and they can, you know, spike the sword in midfield. Yeah. They bring the pump jack out to the middle of the field and bring famous alumni back and y'all just get to pump up the crowd. Literally. That'd be tight. That would be dope. I'm not saying hire me, Texas Tech. Hire me. I'm full of ideas. I'm verified on Twitter, too. That goes somewhere, I think. I can't I don't know. verify for nothing. They did decline me eight times. I'm not asking no more. I'm done with them. Tell them you know me. It probably won't help. Yeah, They'll probably I'm deactivate you. Two times, to be man. honest. They'll probably deactivate it. I'm just saying. I don't even know how I got it, to be honest with you. Sometimes it's just things you can't explain. It is what it is, man. Like, for example, just like, for example, you liking corn. I can't explain it. You can't explain it. It's just that it's just roasted corn for me, you know. But it doesn't. But it's not good for you. Like it brings no nutritional value. Neither does broccoli. Did you know that? It's man-made. Really? Yeah. Broccoli is good though. That's what I'm saying. That's what hurts so bad about it. But but the thing with corn is like the shell. You as a human being cannot process that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It comes out. Um. Well, we know. Um. But you know what I mean? Like you can't process that. You can't digest it or anything. So. Mm I'm just saying, that's, that's why I don't like corn. By the way, this might be a cheat code right here. Um, Carson brings it up on the chat for Chipotle. Their dressing is good, too, and then Dur Wake oh, comes in here. Red. Oh, yes. And then he brings this up. Dur Wake coming in to totally redeem himself after he put corn in the chat. Carson, dude, yeah, I like to get the salad dressing and pour it onto my bowl. Yes, I do that every time. I ask for three, hey. and they get mad at me. I say, I need three. Give me three. Do you tell them who you are? No, but I tell them this. I I will. I will. Whatever I need to do, I need three. A a vinaigrette. And my wife needs her own. So however many she needs after my three, y'all need to provide whatever it is. But yeah, Italian. Is it that good? Yes. It completes it. I haven't had it. I got a couple of Chipotle gift cards or we got one, but we live like right next. So we live in downtown and just a couple streets over. There's a, a Chipotle, and it's just the easiest thing to go get here. Mm-hmm. Might have to try it. Might have to try that yes, sauce. Bro. Ask him for a time. You're going to need at least two. Two okay. for beginners, brother. Two for beginners. Wow. All right. All right. Well, enough food talk here. Enough food talk. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. Mm. Texas Tech, Mississippi State, AutoZone Liberty Bowl in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm. Who you got? Why? 45-42, Texas Tech. Uh, you're sticking with it sticking with it and just because we have nothing they have nothing to lose this is the last I want to say the last time but for now this is the last time these coaches get to represent this university so um, especially for Cumbie I know 
uh, how much the university means to him. I know he wants to go out with the bang, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was on his P's and Q's tonight and um, really did his thing. He always does a great job, but tonight being his last night, um, also knowing that at 12 o'clock, you know, he's upgraded in a sense of being his own boss, getting to run his program the way he does. Um, I think he's going to come out with a lot less on his chest um, than as if he was fighting for his job. So I think he's going to do a great job. And uh, like I said, the second second advantage is we know what Leach is going to do, bottom line. So that's my okay. prediction. Tell us what you got, RC. Well, um, I, I, make, I got a tweet up right now. The Back to 12 podcast at AutoZone Liberty Bowl game predictions. And I have you tagged and everything on here. Mm-hmm. 45-42 Texas Tech. That's right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. I will say this. You will know if Texas Tech can win this game in the first three drives of the game tonight. If they have two three and outs, fat chance. Mm-hmm. I think you have to control the clock. I think you have to do amazing things while running the football. The biggest thing for me tonight on offense for Texas Tech is Donovan Smith. Is the mm-hmm. moment too big? Does he use the RPOs effectively? And he doesn't even have to use the RPOs that much, but at least make it look like you're going to use them. Make the defense aware of it and allow yourself just that split more second of time to get some playmakers involved that, again, you're without Eric as a comma. Who steps up tonight? Is it going to be Geiger? Is it going to be Cleveland? Is it going to be Thark? Koontz, who's it going to be? My guess I think Taj Brooks has a big game tonight for the Red Raiders in the backfield. The Red Raiders try to control the clock, take some deep shots down the field later on. But I do think that the secondary just doesn't hold on enough. Um, I've changed it. I think Texas Tech covers in this one. But I have Mississippi State winning this game, and I have them winning. Let me look at it real quick. I I have it written down. I just want to make sure that I have the right – the spread and everything, and it's at 58 and a half. I want to make sure – that that's right. Mm -hmm. I do have it. There we go. I have it. So the spread right now is at 10 points for Mississippi state. I think Texas tech covers. I think it's 35, 30 Mississippi state. Hmm. That's good. I mean, that's what I think. That's good. That's fair. I I can get behind your, I I mean, I, I pray you're right. Like I want you to be right. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think from a, Try to. T- it's funny. I'm literally about to say from a non-biased Texas Tech point of view, as I wear a Texas Tech hat, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense what I just said there. But here we are in life. My whole life doesn't make a lot of sense. My but, but here we are at this point. At least you got coaching going for you. I just have a face for radio that they're trying to put on camera now. Not bad, brother. You're doing big things. Like I'm trying. I I'm trying. Podcast, I wouldn't have 100 subscribers, brother. So shout out to you. There we go. Right now. There we go. We love to hear it. We appreciate everybody coming in here. We got a poll going right now. We got Texas Tech, Mississippi State. Who do you have winning? Texas Tech right now is winning 56% right now. Mm-hmm. I'm about to tweet it out right now. Who Lyle has winning it. I mean, Texas Tech. Hey, man. Good for mm-hmm. you. Good for you on that front. Man, unbelievable. It, it's crazy that football season is over after tonight for Texas Tech, but at the same time, I feel like there's more excitement than ever for Texas Tech moving forward. Absolutely. I think it's bittersweet, but um, like I said, I think it's um, excitement ahead. I think good things are ahead, and like I said, I'm excited to see for sure. Absolutely. He's Lyle. I'm RC. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Back to 12 podcast. I might be back later on the week. Hey, you weren't on the show when I announced it, I don't think. Chase Champlin, Red Raider Sports. He'll be joining us. Hey. So there, time right there. there we go. Yeah, so we'll have him on the show. He'll be doing a lot of basketball coverage with us and everything like that. He covers it for Red Raider Sports, so he'll be talking to us all season long about that. But, again, Lyle, he's got the good guys winning tonight. I know I'm the depressing guy. I have Mississippi State winning 35-30. He has Texas Tech winning 45-42. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that big red button, like the video, and we'll catch you all next time here on the Back to 12 podcast.